Good evening, everybody. This is Pete Morse, and uh, we are looking at the. No, but it eat my nose wheel bearings out pretty bad. Not a good one. The, uh, we're looking at the uh, Comanche Zoom for tonight. And just to give you an idea of what is going on, I'll share it with you. We have here the ins and outs of aircraft appraisals. We were talking through this last night and there is a lot of stuff to go with this. And it is kind of revealing to, to hear all the things that are involved in doing a correct, a real appraisal. And it really makes you wonder about the, the sales and purchasing of airplanes that have not gone through this process. You know, how did they figure out what they were worth? And so we'll do that once we get going and go back to the, uh, the uh, gallery view here. And who, those of you who are on are free to unmute and say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Welcome everybody, it's CJ. And as far as the Where's Waldo, I'm in uh, Air Harbor, North Carolina today. and. I for pop is behind me. We just flew across the country. And uh, we're really excited to have Tracy come and talk yeah. to us tonight because what became evident was that Blue Book and VREF were one thing, but a genuine appraisal is another. And Tracy's had two Comanches. He's a businessman, so he's very kind of down to earth about it. And uh, it won't necessarily be uplifting, but it's going to be revealing. And everybody just jump in at any quiet moment, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. All right, Dan Homister, uh, 1960, 250, and it's in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Beautiful. Welcome, Dan, and thanks for being here with us. <laughs> Michael Saperton, Deer Valley. Airport Phoenix. I fly a 1963 250 Comanche. And uh, welcome, Michael. Shiny. We're never going to be that shiny, but we're. I know. <laughs> I'm Chief Morris. I'm, uh, I also fly a 1963 Comanche uh, 250, and I'm almost all loaded up to fly to Southern Fun. Yeah, and Pete, what's the count now? I know we had a couple that dropped out due to annuals and avionics upgrades. I'm not real positive. I think the high point is uh, in the low 40s, maybe mid 40s. I can I can check it out while I, while you guys are talking here. Yep. So it's about 55 Comanches with a high of about 45 on Thursday and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday period. Yep. Sounds like the weather report, <laughs> which doesn't look very good for Sunday, by the way. No, everybody be careful. Be Russ Pasco here. I've got a PA 30 at 1964 here in Pensacola, Florida. Well, Russ Pasco, you're in the right place. Welcome and thanks for being here with us. Vernon Dan's here with the 65 U60 Southern California. Doesn't look like an airplane. Look like a Buick. <laughs> Ernie, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. I'll jump in. Uh, hopefully, I'm on muted. Nope. Uh, Alan Cheek here from uh, Peachtree City, Georgia, just south of Atlanta. I have a '63 Comanche that looks exactly like Michael uh, Sapperton's uh, red, white, and black uh, baby over there. So, anyway, I was trying to pull up a photo of it, but I don't. I'm not that smart on that yet, so I'll have to figure that out. <laughs> okay, Welcome, Alan. And not only that, but you're the perfect intro to um, the fact that Michael Saperton, who does Zooms like pretty much for a living, is going to be hosting a Comanche Zoom on how to Comanche Zoom. And I am definitely going to be there because I want to learn how to do that, too. Oh, Good to see okay. you. You know, yeah, yeah, why, yeah. why don't yeah. you just throw me right under the bus? Sorry, <laughs> sorry. But... Hey, you know, yeah, we're brothers right there because our airplanes are painted the exact same paint scheme. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> here's the, uh, so here's the attendance for uh, the days in, in Comanche Town. This is Monday. Oh, okay, so our high of. Tuesday through Sunday and Monday afterwards. So 44 right Good now deal. is the high parked. 
of uh, 44. That's Good. impressive, Pete. Is that based on real numbers in Excel? That's the ones we know about, yes. You're a bad badass. Cool. Well, Pete, Pat Donovan, Russ Wright, Zach Grant, uh, myself, and uh, Tucker Rice, we all work together to try to uh, you know, reach out and make sure everybody comes in, gets handed a fruity drink on arrival, and is welcome. It's Comanche Town. And yeah. um, Hans Newbert is coming, and uh, he's going to have a couple of bombshells to drop. All right, and everybody jump into any quiet moment, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Let me look at something. Mike Newman, I fly a uh, Comanche 250, um, and I'm from Western Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. And uh, I had a question for Pete. Uh, Pete, you're going to have any cups there at uh, Sun Fun? Yes, I will. I will have uh, 48. Yeah, okay. at least. Well, no, more than that. I, got, I have double. I have almost 100 that I'll have with me. Okay. So I registered for uh, four, but um, I didn't see that as an option for a pickup place. It is. It is. They will be there. Okay, good. I'll get, I can get them there. Then I, I, there, it wasn't when I showed it, uh, it gave me a choice of where to pick them up at one of our fly ins or, uh, yep. or, or, but didn't list that. Okay, I'll get them there. I hope then. Okay. I'm leaving. Not to leaving jump in, but uh, I am bringing 200 name tags just in case. So. Yeah, I'm leaving. Uh, Alan, way to go. I'm leaving 36 yeah. cups at home, so I will have those for the later fly-ins. Okay, good. In you fact, should hold up one get, of the cups. I have to get rid of the cups because I have to bring a dog back. Hey, cool. <laughs> what kind of dog? <laughs> a large one. <laughs> Yours, Pete, or are you getting bringing it back on a, a pilots and paws? The uh, my wife's son had this dog in Florida, and the dog is now going to New Hampshire, and we could not do it on Southwest, so therefore it's going to do it out of the Comanche. Cool. That's the best Air use Comanche. of an airplane. <laughs> well, second best. <laughs> okay, second best. Good. Angel flight might be. Angel yep, flight might beat that, but dogs are certainly right in a player with them. Yep. I do angel flight, so uh, that's why I said second best. There you go. Every Comanche should have one dog, at least. Yeah, because you got to have an airport dog with every Comanche. I mean, that's just normal. I'm Tracy, by the way. Um, <laughs> And I'm in Fort Worth. I've had two 250s and a PA-30, so I'm familiar with all of them. Love them. It's a great airplane. We felt like it was a good sign that you had chosen to have three Comanches if you had been an appraiser for that long. <laughs> well, and I got rid of a Baron to buy the first Comanche, I'll be honest. Ooh. All right. I don't think we have any Baron owners in yet, but there are a few coming, I think. CJ, are you in your hangar? Are you at your hangar? No, I actually just flew the Comanche across the country. Uh, I'm at Whiskey 88 in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. And uh, so um, we had a little carb box issue that's now fixed. And uh, so I'm actually in Air Harbor, which is this amazing old style airport. I recommend everybody stop into Air Harbor. So are you heading back home or out somewhere? Comanche Town. Oh, oh. <laughs> what was your routing, CJ, from California to North Carolina? Just that. Uh, Flight Aware, November 7654 Papa. Just count down from uh, seven and add a P, and you'll see the routing. Um, okay. Yep. Got it. And I won't take everybody's time. Uh, found some great airports. And a little 180 was a sweetheart, despite her card box issue. So everybody jump in any quiet moment, say who you are, where you are, and. I'm, I'm uh, Josh Simpson, 
and um, I'm up in Western Massachusetts. We, uh, my wife and I are both pilots. We fly out of uh, uh, Turner's Falls, Montague, Zero Bravo 5. And I have a, a 250 Comanche that I've had for about 20 years. And, uh, and we, we actually also have a Cessna 172 that uh, when we wanna go somewhere slowly, which, <clears throat> which uh, hasn't been anywhere for the past year because the Cessna first went in to get painted and then went in for new avionics. And that took immeasurably long time. Um, I mean, light year, I mean, just it's taken, it went in in September of 19 and it's not back yet. And uh, actually it was about to be delivered back just before, the week before Christmas with the avionics done. And they offered to give me a free annual, but in doing that, they did an AD on the, uh, on, on the crankshaft found that the crankshaft was uh, pitted and had to rebuild the engine, which ended up with us having, buying a brand new Lycoming 180 uh, 0360 engine, which I think is the same thing that you've got in your, in your um, 180 command. It is. And so please yep, tell the me. the 360 for the 170. Please tell me it's a good engine. It's an awesome engine. I, um, it's an awesome engine in a Comanche 180 and a 172. It's a little more disappointing, but yeah, that little 180 behind me trues with uh, virtually no speed mods. The brakes are reversed and she's got the Metco tips and she trues at about, uh, at low, 141 knots, which is just two knots better than book and up high at about 147 true airspeed. you will like it. That's great. So, yeah, yeah. Um, well, and then wife... bulletproof. I was just going to say, my wife will also join us later. She's on another Zoom call right now. Well, Josh and Katie, welcome. And thank you also for uh, the donation to Comanche Research and uh, keeping the operations going. Much appreciated. I'll everybody jump everybody in and just say who you are, where you are. I just want to remind everybody, these are all recorded. So if you miss any bit of it, for whatever reason, you can always go back and listen to it or watch it uh, tomorrow. And you guys have done 55 of these? That's pretty amazing. Yep, it's an entire library of knowledge. And we're on a mission to collect uh, Comanche-related knowledge, um, the knowledge of some of the amazing people that have kept our airplanes all these years. If uh, you know of somebody whose knowledge you think should be captured, we take absolutely take recommendations. And um, a number of these have been recommendations from people who said, talk, talk to this person. So. Uh, Feel free to stick a note in the chat room or send an email or text. And everybody jump into any quiet moments, say who you are, where you are and what you fly and welcome to Tracy Liggins uh, Zoom on Comanche on all aircraft appraisals. We're pretty excited. Hello, it's John Fodder from Orange Mass, 9317 Papa, 260C, 1969. Greetings. Happy flying, CJ. <laughs> Welcome, John Futter, and your beautiful airplane. Thanks for being here with us tonight. And you probably already saw George, George Merriam is here as well. Haven't as yet. I'll go look for him there. Yep. And I'm relaying Patricia Keeper's um, greetings to everybody. She's in a noisy location, and we're dragging her in to talk about uh, flying the uh, around the world air race, an unlimited race. Uh, which they won in a twin Comanche against all types. Um, so thanks for being here, Pat. Everybody else, jump in any quiet moment, say who you are, where you are, and what you. This is Mark Deep. Hey. I'm uh, located in Nebraska and I fly a 400. And I was uh, curious if you had any more updates on the, uh, the shoulder harness STC. So the, uh, the shoulder harness STC, we have, we're negotiating a group I special and I was supposed to make a call to Alpha and Filler because we have 55 people, no more, 58 people who have said we need shoulder harnesses. So I apologize because I was hoping to have news on that tonight and ended up investigating um, a bit of a cylinder question, which looks like it's fine. <laughs> Um, we should have news on that, and we will get the news out on Delphi and Facebook, and when we ever finally get the Nor'easter out in there, 
and then um, so there's not a new STC. There are two STC shoulder harnesses for the Comanche. One is um, Alpha Aviation in Minnesota, and uh, the and they they are the STC holder in addition to shoulder harnesses and any color rubbing you want to match your airplane uh, for AmSafe if you want the airbags. And then um, Phil Air, that's Paul Phillips in Dover, Delaware, for his shoulder harness, slightly different installation. Um, both of them absolutely compliant. The alphas uh, known as being a little bit stronger, but also a little bit longer to install. Okay, thank you. I, and I apologize. I meant to say the group by not the STC. Oh, but it's actually, this knowledge is so crucial. It's like the first thing we're like, everybody before you do your avionics <laughs> or anything else, if you don't have shoulder, just put them in. So thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, thank I, you. I, I wanted to show you guys something the other night cj when when i registered to become part of the comanche society i i didn't know my actual serial number for my plane and so i typed it into my computer in google because i figured i'd get to the faa website instead what came up when i typed in november 7613 pop of my end number what came up was a group of things for sale including a shower curtain, a duvet cover, <laughs> note cards. And, and this, is the, this is the shower curtain of, this is our airplane with our farm in the background. Oh my Lord. And uh, I- It's we, on the internet as a- We bought, you can this, buy we bought this thing for 65 bucks because we, we, we uh, an artist painted a picture of our farm and our plane and and somehow it got sold to some other company and now it's now it's a product you can buy that is hilarious no royalties for you it was <laughs> like a complete surprise i think i'd be saying you're gonna have to send me one of those or i'm gonna sue you <laughs> <laughs> we paid 65 bucks for that and uh, but i well, held the line at note cards that yeah. is too cool Maybe yeah, we should sell muted. them and use the receipts. You're right. I think we need to start selling those and use the receipts to support Comanche parts research. Add it to the cup. And everybody jump in any quiet moment and just uh, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Hey all, uh, my name is Doug Fitzpatrick. I uh, hope you can hear me fine because I'm in the car right now. Uh, Southern California out of Foxtrot 70 French Valley. Uh, don't have a Comanche yet uh, in the market, so I figured this uh, sounded really relevant and uh, find 172 primarily at the moment. Doug, welcome and uh, yeah, welcome to the group and great good luck on your search. Uh, the prices have been going up, um, which is a good thing and a bad thing. And uh, we will try to do our very best to help you find your perfect Comanche match. Good to you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you for everything you do. It's a wealth of knowledge that I've seen from this group. That's part of why we like our Comanches, because we fly them. <laughs> Welcome to you. Thanks for being And jump into any quiet moment, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Hi, I'm Gil Kesser. I fly a 260 uh, Culpeper, Virginia, and I'm uh, rebuilding a, a, a twin Comanche uh, 97. So, um, excuse me, uh, 67. So, that's my. Welcome, Gil, and thanks for being part of us. You're, you've got two right now one that's flying and one that's uh, being restored. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. I just got the engines running on the twins, so um, I'm sorry about that. But there's plenty to go to before that flies. Well, congratulations and thank you for saving her. Welcome. You are not. Bill, this is uh, Robert Klein. I'm down at Orange County in Virginia. I uh, go up to Culpeper every now and then. I'll have to look you up. Thanks. Uh, my, my twin's actually in Warrington, 
but uh, my uh, my uh, my two sixties and uh, Culpepper. So I'm hoping to get them both in the same airfield here within the next six months. Sounds good. Robert, while you're here, you may as well introduce yourself and your fabulous bird. Well, uh, I'm Robert Klein. I fly a 180 out of uh, Orange County, Virginia, which is like in the middle of the state. And uh, I'm one of the guys behind the scenes on the Zoom. I've, I, I collect the stats or I look at them and uh, let people know how many people have attended. And so far, we're we've been doing really well we've had over we are approaching 7000 hours of uh webinars uh in less than a year that number is you know close to 400,000 minutes if you want if you like big numbers well it's 400,000 otherwise it's 7000 hours but it's it's just really nice on how we have people come in and stay in and uh make contributions it's just great just reminds me of the Comanche folks of old when I joined in the 80s. Thank you. you can have a Thanks for being here, Robert, and for all you do. Speaking of contributions, I think I'm going to share a little bit of the uh, the website here, I hope. Yeah. So there it is. And this is the Comanche, uh, Northeast Comanche Tribes website itself. Uh, what I want to point out is down at the bottom, there's a place here where you can donate. On the officers page, uh, there is also a uh, document, a, a Zoom a, a link page, which I'll go to at the top here. Uh, if you need to find anything uh, or sign up for anything, this is where you would go. For instance, there's a tribe membership application here. There's a feedback form. If you have ideas about how we can do things better, uh, that's what you would do. It comes right to me. Uh, the Comanche Zoom ones are down here, the swap shop input and the listing, as well as the CD for the uh, thousand hour gear thing. Up here is the, the New England uh, cup order form. Uh, I will have cups at the at, uh, Sun and Fun, so you can pick them up there if you want to. Uh, and there's all kinds of other stuff going on here. So uh, if you go to the tribe officers page, here it is, down at the bottom. Here's a way of donating. You can donate using the Venmo account. This goes directly to our treasurer, Malcolm Dickinson. You can see his name up there. And then over here is, if you want to mail in a check, do it the old uh, Pony Express way. That's how you, you can get it there. There is also PayPal. If you get the Comanche uh, Zoom invitation from Les, it's there. I don't have it yet on the website. And that's some end of my sales pitch. Well, the next time we're going to have to put up uh, the pictures of the t-shirts and the coffee mugs because when uh, uh, one of the guys that got the coffee mug sent me a picture of his black coffee mug with this gorgeous like white, you know, emb embossed Comanche and then the red middle with the black coffee steaming in it. And I was like, need mug now. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll try to make it a little more show and tell. I just want to acknowledge that Pete and uh, Robert and a couple other people in the background, um, Bernie and Les, spend so many hours and uh, you know make all this happen. Get the invites ready, pull the material together, get the like. If you need a part and you put a request into that swap shops form, they make sure that it gets put on the website and it gets sent out to everybody. If you have something to sell that's sitting around in your hangar and that needs a new home. The, you know, find a little more gas money. They uh, they get all those and they compile them into a spreadsheet and send them all out. So you can so just a note that if you fill in that swap shop form, you can sell anything from an airplane to an old wheel. And in fact, there are airplanes and wheels on there. <laughs> and if you need a part, like a part for your a door hinge, uh, people have found parts through the swap shop. So it seems to be working. And um, just thank you all, everybody in the background. And everybody just jump in any quiet moment, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Hank Spellman, uh, Kilo Alpha 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 in the middle of the cornfields of Illinois, uh, <laughs> by 5903 Papa, which is a 1959 uh, airplane, a Comanche 250, 
And I just got word that uh, the annual is complete and we're making arrangements to pick it up. I took it in last Saturday. Now, Hank, that is one well cared for bird if Cliff just completed an annual in what, four days? <laughs> yes. That is well done. Well, welcome and thank you for being here and thanks for all you do to support us on the airplanes. Always glad to have you. You're quite welcome. My name is uh, Mike Ellis. I fly uh, November 6928 Papa out of Moline, Illinois. I'm just northwest of Hank. Um, my plane is also ready up at Cliffs to be picked up as soon as the weather breaks. We doing? It. I think you guys should plane pool. You can uh, go up. You can fly each other back. That's perfect. Well, welcome, Mike. Thanks for being here with us, and congratulations both of you on getting done with annuals in record time. At least I hope. Yeah, mine was a, mine was a week and a half, so it's <laughs> a little bit longer. Still darn quick. Congratulations, you guys, and welcome to the uh, to the Zoom on um, aircraft appraisals. Everybody, jump into any quiet moment. Who we are, where we are, and I'm what you're I'm based in Newburgh, North Carolina, and I fly nine three nine three pop, which is a nineteen sixty nine C. Phil Kniff. It is very much an honor and pleasure to have you. And I'm glad to see your face. <laughs> good, good afternoon. Go ahead, Hi. Robert. OK, good afternoon, uh, Rodney Kubik, um, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, uh, 1961 Piper Comanche, 180 horse. and. Um, I also have got a 1947 Luscom 8A that I fly regularly too. It's a great little airplane also. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my, uh, I, I've got some wheel forks off of my Comanche. I, I think I should probably put them up there because that'd be a, a good, uh, a good uh, thing for someone sometime. Yeah. Absolutely, you know where to find the form. Rodney, thank you for being here. And uh, yeah, thank you for letting somebody have a chance to get some good new for uh, good use <laughs> wheel forks. And the Luscombe, what a fabulous, beautiful classic. Thank you. Hey, it's uh, Milton Ames. I'm in Tucson, Arizona with the 1959 Comanche 250. And annual right now should be out in about three weeks. And I plan to fly to Oshkosh this summer. Milton, we are looking forward to having you and your 59 Comanche at Comanche Town at Oshkosh. Welcome, and it is a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks. We got about Just three to minutes. note that the 59 250s, okay. Got about three more minutes to go here. Good heads up. Well, everybody jump into any quiet space, say who you are, where you are, and what you fly. Hi, I'm Troy Watson. I'm in Texas, just south of BFW, and I fly a 59 Comanche T50, and I've got a 64 uh, Satabri also in the hangar I play around with. Troy Watson, welcome. So you go upside down in your Satabri, and you stay right side up in your Comanche, or do you mix it up? I do go in the well, Satabri on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Troy, welcome. Thanks for being with us. I'm Al Powers in Seattle. I have a 64 Twin Comanche that I've owned more than 50 years. Uh, first time on Zoom, I'm enjoying it. Al Powers, it is an honor and a pleasure to have you, sir. Thank you for being part of this. Hope you enjoy it, should be interesting. And look forward to seeing you again. I just wanna say 50 years, so we have a couple. So Pat Kiefer, hers has been in the family since 71, I think it is. Um, but you are amongst a really cool, rare crowd. And it's always a pleasure to have people who've had their Comanches for half a decade, half a century. Uh, mine has been an Oshkosh winner in the past, and it's it's uh, unusual. It's counter-rotated and has a Robertson 
modification. So I call it a twin engine super cub. <laughs> that is perfect. Well, at uh, Oshkosh, uh, the Miller's Miller twin will be there. And I'm trying to think of what else, but I think you should come to Oshkosh if you can. And uh, we'll, we'll have cool twins. Okay, if uh, <laughs> well, uh, 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 for Pete, can we sign up for that on the Northeast Pride page for Oshkosh? Not yet, not yet. Okay, it will be up uh, probably after next week. Okay, uh, at this point, I'm going to uh, again mute everybody just to keep it quiet for a moment here. Uh, you will have the opportunity to unmute if you want to. And uh, we're gonna hand it over to Tracy. I'm gonna quickly just share the, uh, the Zoom I was using right along with a uh, PowerPoint of what's going on. For those of you that, had, that uh, didn't get to see this when you checked in, this is the topic for tonight and a little bit of background on, on Tracy. And with that, I think Tracy's all set to go. So we'll let him carry away. I would suggest all of you go to the speaker view that's the single thing up there in the in the view part. And that way you can see his face up close and personal while he does his thing. No, don't do that, whatever you do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anybody wanna see me up close and personal. That would scare them to death. I did actually try to clip my hair today, but never mind, that didn't work out well. Good evening. We're all still here, Tracy, so you must be doing something. I, right. I sometimes scare off little kids, but most adults can handle me. I, you know, that's just one of those things, CJ. Uh, it's good to be here, and I'm glad CJ called me and asked about this because I uh, I frequent the, the Facebook page, and I look down there, and I watch all that's going on, and I keep seeing all the questions. I'm going, you know, there is an art, there is a science behind what our Comanches are worth and why they're worth what they're worth and why they will never be worth what we would like them to be worth. But the truth is, if you own a Comanche, you own a good airplane, it's worth what you put into it because you put it into it. Uh, if you ever expect to get it back, maybe not. But uh, you do them because we love the airplanes. I mean, that's what it's about. And I thought I would go into some information on aircraft appraisals, what is and isn't considered an appraisal, what really is an appraisal, and what you can get into when you don't get one, uh, and help, help you guys understand the return on investments and, and what's going on. So let me share this particular screen with you. And I am going to pull up a slide presentation that we did for the PAAO, which is the Professional Aircraft Appraisal Organization, of which I am one of the board members and one of the founding board members. And it is designed for professional appraisers, those that have been trained and go through school to understand what, what value is assigned and how to assign it and what to do. There's some truth about aircraft appraisals that you need to follow through on and understand. It is unregulated. There are no state regulations. There's no national regulations. Uh, anybody can claim to be an aircraft appraiser. They might appraise jewelry on the side. They might do art. They might do cars. They may or may not have a background in aviation. They may or may not have any training in, in appraising, believe it or not. So therefore, they may have absolutely no experience, whatever. And they can say, I can do an appraisal for you. <clears throat> there really is no published standard of reporting other than what USPAP publishes. And even, even in that, numbers on napkins are an acceptable form of presentation. They don't tell you a lot, but they certainly are accepted some places. And the worst part of it is there's no public database of aircraft selling prices. It is not available to us. We really can go to publications and websites, but you have to understand they're in the publishing business. They're not in the valuation business for the most part. And there are a couple of exceptions to that, which we'll get to here in a second. Historically, the National Aircraft Appraisers Association was the first appraisal organization to be formed within the US. Started operations in the early 80s. It set a code of ethical behavior for aircraft appraising. 
the appraisal process they designed was to require a site visit to physically examine the aircraft and its record. They generated a standardized approach to calculating valid values and a standardized reporting format that would be used when it went back to you so that you would see a report that made sense. The database was proprietary and was indeed based on actual selling prices of aircraft and equipment. Very difficult database to, uh, to get a hold of, but the NAA certified appraisers and reports were commonly used by bankers, attorneys, owners, buyers, uh, anybody in the, in the general public that wanted to get a real value on an aircraft, but they ceased operations in December of 2018. The reason was we think it was just simply retirement and how an association vanishes is beyond us. How did the PAO come about? Well, the PAO was formed in 2018, the month that the NAAA disappeared. And we started operations in the 1st of January, 2019, after the previous organization stopped supporting anything. It was initially comprised of several trained, experienced aircraft appraisers who had been certified in the previous organization. And it consists of domestic and international appraisers even today. There's 100 plus members of it, 125, I think is what the current number is. And it is a for-profit LLC. It's not an association. We don't have any members other than the executive members of the LLC. Well, we have associates who are appraisers and those associates are uh, trained and go through our classes, uh, have to be recurrently trained and have to follow some ethics that we publish and get out there. The value statement and our mission statement, what we want to accomplish, it exists to develop and support value experts through training, certification, and adherence to the highest ethical standards and processes to ensure that our associates promote public trust and maintain the highest levels of credibility and competence. Competency in appraising is something that we value and the professional interest and a professional way of doing that is considered critical to, uh, to the mission. Our objectives maintain standards of professional contact. We do also require field visits. We'll get to that in a minute and the reason for it. We require every appraiser to go through training classes to understand the procedures and the standards of professional practice and professional appraisal and how an appraisal should be adhered to and done. We've got an adherence to ethical behavior and we'll get a few of those items in a minute. Um, and we decided it was time to establish new processes for, for this century. One, we started doing criminal background checks on every applicant that wants to become an associate on all the board. We, we weren't exempt. Uh, we wanted to make sure the people coming in were trustworthy, were not felons, were not, were not escapees from uh, somewhere. And we review all the applications very carefully. We look for several things. One is an aircraft background. We require that everybody have some aircraft experience and background, whether they're owners, whether they're mechanics, whether they're uh, pilots, but we want them familiar with aircraft and we're familiar with aircraft operations. We review the appraisal reports. The first 10 really that a new appraiser does are all sent to the board. Uh, we got a technical committee that evaluates those, looks at those and makes sure that the reporting meets the standards and followed the guidelines. And we've got a best practices statement that you can see on the website. Um, it's appraiseaplane.org. If you wanna go look at, uh, at the main website and see what our best practices recommend and you'll see why we recommend them. But it, assures that we're gonna maintain a high degree of credibility and reliability on all of the reporting and conduct. How are we organized? Well, we've got an executive committee, a training and membership committee, an ethics committee and a technical committee. And obviously all of that leads itself to assuring that we do the right thing, both software wise, training wise, education wise, uh, technical wise, ethics wise, and your associates and our associates are all required to participate in that. Who is it? Who are the board members and officers at the present time? President and chairman, managing director is Michael Simmons. He's been appraising since the early 90s. 
Vice President and Managing Director of Membership is Pat Duggins. Pat's been uh, an FAA instructor in uh, loss and uh, accident investigation for a long time, still does that. Uh, Del Fogg is an ex-airline man and a CFO and treasurer of our group. There's me, uh, sorry about that, but I do all of the uh, .NET, .biz websites, as well as the .org. We also operate the training at appraiseaplane.org, which is a separate website that is an online school, if you will, uh, that takes somewhere around 40 to 80 hours to get through on the training levels. Uh, and I do developer liaison work with the outside developers that we hire. Secretary is Paul Irvin. And then we've got four other members that uh, are down here that are at large and, and work with us. Alan Lance, Ken Dancing, George Nardone, which many of you may know for the insurance industry. Mark Baird, uh, which is a very well uh, mech known mechanic out in California and also teaches uh, some classes in uh, aircraft maintenance. What does it mean to be an appraiser, a professional appraiser? Well, you're part of a community of like-minded individuals who want to provide unbiased, credible, reliable reports. It takes training, it takes networking, it takes support and mentoring, and it takes following a set of best practices to assure that the result is credible. That is our main focus. It's different from ownership and sales. We've got different objectives. We give an unbiased opinion versus any sort of profit-based opinion. There's no connections with the subject aircraft. And if there is, we really can't do the report or we have to disclose what that relationship might be in that report. We do a lot of research and a lot of statistical evaluation of the market versus guessing at it. And that means the current market. We have to go out on each airplane and look at what's going on in the market. We've got a statistician on staff that does work and looks at statistics that we can draw in from several locations uh, to know what the market's actually doing. And that's done monthly, every single month that's updated at the beginning of the month. Here's the key ethics that we got to. Associates will not, shall not, cannot accept an assignment they are unqualified or unable to complete. We want appraisers to look at your airplane that are familiar with that airplane in the sense of make, model, and they understand ins and outs of particular type. So if you call them up and want a B-25 appraised, they better have appraised a B-25 somewhere in the background. Believe it or not, I have. I've even done a constellation. So there are things that we want to make sure these guys that do this are qualified. Associates have absolutely no financial ties to the aircraft or the deal of that aircraft, and they are never to provide predetermined results. I've had a lot of people call me up and say, hey, I found this airplane. It's $45,000. Can you give me an appraisal that you know, would substantiate that? No. <laughs> it's that simple. I don't know what it's worth. I haven't seen it yet. So no, I cannot give you a predetermined value on, a, on an appraisal. We do not do desktop reports ordinarily. There are some exceptions, but we don't do them for any of the new associates or anybody that hadn't been appraising for quite some time. And then there are restrictions, even, even if we have seen an airplane before, we ordinarily want to relook to make sure everything is up to date. So we don't do desktops. And a lot of people go, well, why not? All I need is a desktop report to tell me what it's worth. How? We haven't seen the airplane. All of our sign reports have an on-site physical examination of the aircraft, its records, and all of its public information that we can get our hands on. It's a differentiation between PAAO appraisers and everybody else out there. Blue Book, they've never seen your airplane. They don't know. BREF, they've never seen your airplane. They don't know. And they certainly haven't seen all the records on it. So how do they establish value? We don't provide verbal appraisals. Appraisals are credible opinions of value based on a review of all of these things. And a lot of clients don't understand the difference in that terminology and methodology. So part of our job has been to train the public, like having meetings here and letting you know why we do what we do. We know what to do. We know when to do it. And we get out and do it. It consists of policies, procedures, ethics, bylaws. If we don't follow those, it doesn't mean anything if we 
don't react and have the proper actions. So we are only as good as our worst report and the PAO is only as good as its worst associate. So we try to keep track of that. That is that particular set of things that we are tending to. Now I want to go back here uh, and get the next slide up here. Give me just a minute and I'm gonna pull these up because this is, uh, this is the next thing that I need to get into. Oops, I did that wrong. Here we go. Here we go. Get this one up there. This is a presentation about my business that I did for some banks and uh, some other individuals that wanted to know how we work and how I work and what we did differently than a lot of other appraisers. But here's a typical day. I get somebody call up, I need help in financing to buy a great aircraft, it's a real bargain. And as you can see in the background, that may or may not be the case. In this particular case, it obviously, it, we trust what the client's telling us, but we're gonna verify and document that and we're gonna substantiate what that airplane is worth based on fact, not on fiction, not on guesstimates. We look at 337s and registrations. We work with title companies and get title searches, verify ownerships, identified liens or clouds that might have affected. We get security agreements from the banks and identify the collateral and banks quite often will give us the information that we're looking for. So we get release of liens and all of that in the background. And that's just common research uh, in looking at an aircraft. A classic definition of appraisal is an act or instance of appraising, especially evaluation of property by the estimate of an authorized person. It sets a value on, it estimates the amount of. It's to evaluate the worth, significance, or status specifically, and especially to give an expert judgment of value or the merit of the particular process of aircraft that we're looking at in this case. This is a true example, and it's kind of scary to look at this, but here's the problem with books and just simple quick valuations. This comes from a turbo prop, and it's an actual fact. The aircraft was used by Jump School. They got a loan of 1.2 million on it. They went bankrupt. The loan's in default. The bank needed a certified appraisal for the banking board when they had to get this thing sold to find out what it was worth in order to sell it properly. And the report came back at $300,000. They were shocked. They said, but we got it appraised. Well, here's a question. How was it determined? Who determined it and how did they get it? Well, we got a piece of paper in our files. I see the envelope out in the middle of this slide. Honestly, this was what they had in their file. It was signed by a gentleman, but he never said where he got that value, where he came up with that work, who he was or how he evaluated the airplane. It just said it's worth 1.2 million. In researching backwards, he had just grabbed a book, said, well, the average airplane's worth this, this one's got this amount. Yeah, okay, it's worth this. And that's where it came from. And he gave it to the bank and the bank said, okay, they didn't know any better. A number that is not substantiated really cannot be worth very much. It has to be related in reference to a specific aircraft using firsthand analysis and a number should also be referenced against current market conditions. If we don't do those things, the value we come up with is not credible. And that's one of the things we wanna make sure we get is credible values. Who performs the analysis? Well, is it somebody that is impartial to the deal? Is it somebody that the bank has on staff? Is it somebody that the broker has on staff? How is it related? And it should be totally impartial. They should follow published standards and ethics. And it needs to be somebody that stands behind and supports the report. If you have a question on what you got out of a book, who do you call? Uh, I don't think you're going to be able to get much substantiation and help by calling Aircraft Blue, Aircraft Blue Book or BREF and saying, hey, I did this analysis uh, based on your information. I need this information to, to be fact. And there they're going to laugh because it wasn't fact. It was just what they published. A current appraisal is a statement of value that is referenced to an on-site examination of the aircraft and records and performed by a supported and trained professional. Without that, how do you know? 
here's many ways of evaluating an aircraft, published guides. All right, who is the expert? Where did the data come from? And how old is that data? And is it based on current market or is it based on a market from a year ago? Is it based on a trend? Do they look at it every month? Do they look at it every six months? Do they look at it every three months? How often do they update that market data? And who's going to stand behind it? If you pull those guides out and read it, it's copyrighted material. So, well, okay, fine, I can read it. Now the next question is, is that aircraft configured exactly the way they published that book? Is it got exactly the equipment and in the hours and conditions and everything else that they published in that book? Was it adjusted far properly? Was it seen properly? Do not get me wrong. Book values are looked at by an official appraisal, but that's different than just saying that's what it's worth. In many cases, it's above that number. In many cases, it's below that number. And I'll be honest, I have yet to see the average aircraft period, end of conversation. I've never found one. Desktops, here's why we don't do desktops. The distance between the appraiser and that aircraft. I am going to have to get data from somebody about this airplane. Where does it come from? Well, sales literature is usually what's available. I've got a spec sheet on this airplane. Here's what it's got hours wise. Here's what it's got equipment wise. And here's all the good stuff about it. It's paints of eight, interiors of seven. Man, it's a great airplane. And these are the hours that are on. Okay, that's all the positives. Now, are there any negatives? In most cases, sales literature isn't going to mention or they're going to downplay any negatives on it. It's out of annual, but an annual is simple to do and we'll take care of it when you buy it. Do understand. Annuals do not include repairs. Annuals are an inspection only. The repairs that go with that are a different question. So that doesn't meet our reporting standards. To do a certified appraisal report, they require, and we require, an on-site examination of the aircraft and its records. We look at all the key value points and there's over 200 of them even on a simple airplane. And all those value points are examined and considered. We use current market data. And by that, I mean yesterday's, this morning's first of the month. The appraiser certified by the PAAO, we hope is what you use. There are two other bodies that certify aircraft appraisers. We are the only ones that make sure they have aircraft backgrounds. ASA and ISA both use equipment manufacturer or equipment appraisers and, and put aircraft into that category where you're appraising equipment and business property, uh, we put it as a separate entity as aircraft alone. We support the reports now and in the future. We're going to be around. Here's how we go about the process. We get a base value of a make model year of an aircraft using current market data and values matching in for comparable aircraft. Now, a base value means we strip the aircraft back to an aircraft that is airworthy, needs an engine overhaul, needs interior, needs paint, needs radios, and then start adding back based on the criteria of this particular airplane, the subject. We look at the overall condition. And how do you evaluate the overall condition of an airplane off of the book? You, you can't. I mean, how do you do it? You've got to have some way to know the overall condition. We look at the total hours. Of course, it's important. We look at the overall paint and interior, both in condition and quality. How do you rate the quality through a picture? You can't. You see a good looking paint job. You go, oh man, that's excellent. That's great condition. You get up close to it. You see the bubbling from the cruciform uh, corrosion down under it. You see the other problems that may exist with the paint. You see that they didn't strip it all the way down when they repainted it. You only find that stuff in the log books. What's the overall condition of the engine? How long has that engine been in service? Total time. How long since a specific type of overhaul? How many types of overhaul? I'll just ask a question, see if you guys got it. How many types of overhaul do you pay attention to? There's a field overhaul to service limits. There's a field overhaul to factory new limits. There's a factory overhaul. There's a factory remand, and there's a new engine. 
do those make a difference in value? And if you think they don't, you might want to rethink what you're thinking. Not only that, how long since that overhaul was done? We know as Part 91 operators, we don't have to pay any attention to times, do we? So what if it's over 12 years since we overhauled it? If you look at Lycoming and Continental overhauled at either 2,000 hours so or 12 years. Now, the, the, that we pay attention to, but it is one that is important to establishing uh, value. Oh, Zoom, mommy. And, uh, and the, uh, the reason for that value is based on the type of overhaul done. A factory overhaul is worth more than most field overhauls, although there are some major shops that do better than the factory. Uh, if I look at Firewall Forward, if I look at Victor Sloan, if I look at some of these other plants out there that do these engines, they may actually beat the factory at an overhaul. And the other thing is they also give warranties. A lot of field overhauls are just done by a local mechanic and he says, well, here's the limits and you're all within limits. I'm going to put it back together and you're good to go. But how long are you good to go? Did he replace all of those to new factory standards or did he replace them to standard limits? Propeller condition, type, total time in service, time since the overhaul. Then the overall maintenance records and completeness of those records. These are critical to the values of our airplanes. I've seen log books that are easy to read. I've seen log books that it took a PhD to read. I've seen log books that even hieroglyphics couldn't read. And I've seen them where there's 10 years missing or five years missing or three years missing, two years missing. What was going on with that airplane during those two years, particularly if it had a couple of hundred hours worth of flight time on it? What happened to it? Where was it? Where were there was no maintenance done during that period of time? And those things become critical to the value as well. Any time life or cycle life limited items on any of those times and what are those items and what are those items worth? Good example of that's our thousand hour gear AD. How was it done? Who did it? And did they do the complete AD? If not, was it really done? It may be listed in the logbook as being completed and then you go back and try to figure out what was done because all it says is good thousand hour gear AD. What did they do? Did they do the entire thing or did they do part of the thing? And I will promise you, in many cases, we find part of it was all that was done. We look at every single avionic in that airplane. We specific list and each avionic is listed and each avionic is assigned a market value. And all of that is installed in that aircraft is critical to that aircraft value. Is there a DI system? And I, what's the condition of that system? Then we look for any additional equipment, air, AC units, uh, modifications, et cetera. Then it comes down to the negative items because on every airplane, there will be some negatives in most cases, maybe not much, but there will be some. It may have high airframe time. It may have some damage history and a good portion of our Comanches do. Uh, unfortunately, some of them have been on their blades more than once. How much does that impact value? And that's something that has to be determined by examination and looking and by the items that show up in the log books. What maintenance items are currently needed? Do I need to redo that gear AD? What ADs are needed, if any? What about poor paint? If, if paint is terrible, do, what, do I add a value for that paint or do I take away from it? In some cases, you have to deduct for it. Same thing with the poor interior. If you can't really, if it's not serviceable, if it's not usable because it's all ripped up, shredded up, and springs are sticking out, then that's not going to help the value of that airplane. It's going to be a negative. What about all the avionics? What if there are some of them that are placarded in op? Does that reduce the value? Yes, it does. Not only that, you don't know how much it's going to cost to fix in some cases. What about missing logs and how far? These are the things that we look at that we use in order to do and enter an appraisal. Certified appraisals use standard reporting formats. We try to adhere to USPAP standards and try to get those standards utilized by all of our members. Title work, 
this is a value added service when getting an appraisal done. You can say, hey, I'm going to work with so-and-so title company. Would you work with them on the appraisal and get that to the bank, blah, 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 certainly. But that would include a title search and all the document filings that we need to get them done. We can also work as closing agents to make sure all the forms are done right, get the signatures done right, ensure the documents are filed properly through your title company with the FAA. And then some of us, like me, I'll work as a buyer's agent. People can call me up and say, I'm looking for a Fly Royster 350, and I would really like a newer one. Can you help me locate one that's worth the money? And the answer is yes, I can. I do not do that as a percentage of the sale. I do it on a flat rate. We found that if you have an interest in the aircraft, you're going to push a particular one over some other one that may not be the best buy. By doing a flat rate, we've got no dog in the hunt. We will look for the best aircraft we can find out there, and that's what we find. So there is a flat number that we use depending on the type of aircraft you're looking for, depending on where you want us to look. And uh, we will go out and find the best aircraft we can find for you. If you're a new buyer, we'll consult with you to make sure that you're not buying an airplane you really have no business in owning as a first owner. If you have a mission statement that you need to use this airplane for, and I get into biz jets a lot, and they've got a mission that they need to fly from here to California, uh, from New York to California in some cases, from there to Hawaii, from there to Australia, obviously the mission may become critical to the purchase of the aircraft. So that's the type of things that consultants and uh, appraisers do. Then we get down to where you guys want to know the answers to. Return on investments. If I'm going to spend money on my airplane, can I find the money that we need to do that? And how much of that am I going to get back? What's the value of all the improvements I just put on this airplane? And I will tell you something that you need to be aware of and pay attention to. The cost of that improvement, those avionics you added, will never be fully added to the market value. They can't be. It's just not the way the market works. Paint, interiors, and avionics absolutely will return part of what you spent. But there are limits within the marketplace, and that can cause you a lot of loss if you don't know what those are at the time you put them in. Getting an appraiser involved can help you evaluate the results prior to any work. You can help you condition your mind to the reality of the market. You may still choose to put in a whole lot of money and that's your business. That's your airplane. You want to do that? That's your business. And I'm all for it. But I will tell you, you may find yourself upside down. Bailey Bullet comes to mind. And I've raised that up because how many of you are familiar with that Bailey Bullet? It was a gorgeous twin Comanche that he did. But by the time they got through with it at $450,000, $460,000 in the late 90s, there was no way it was market compatible. It just wasn't. It was still a 60 model airplane. And no matter what happens to aircraft, as they age, they age. And you can't erase it no matter what you do to it. You can improve it. You can make it great. But can you ever make it worth what a new aircraft is going for on the marketplace? And the answer to that is no. Sorry, it just didn't going to happen. That's, uh, that was my presentation for that, but I do have a couple of more things I want to show you. Uh, if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'm going to pull that up and I got to get out of this one. And I'm going to go over here and talk about seven factors. This comes from Beechcraft, by the way. Um, seven factors that impact value. Everybody knows these. And this you can get from Beechcraft, Textron Beechcraft. And, and they go, well, these are the seven major factors affecting the value of a pre-owned aircraft. Get this, aircraft hours and age. And they talk about it. It loses a certain amount of value for every hour it flies over the average. Well, yeah. What is the average fleet? Well, there are numbers out there for getting the average fleet hours. Are they accurate? And the answer is how? I don't report the number of hours I fly per year to anybody, but 
I do when I put the sales information up there, publish the number of hours on my airplane. So we can calculate them. The flying fleet average is good for basic reasons, but it may or may not impact your value. Plus or minus 30%, does it matter? And the answer is no, it really doesn't. Way under that, way over that does make a difference. How far over that? Yeah, anything over 30%. Early in an aircraft's life cycle, the airframe hours have a greater impact on the value than they do in later years. In later years, where all of our command chiefs sit, it's the age that impacts the resale value more than the hours. Now, that may not be something we all want to hear, but that's reality, folks. I cannot erase age. I turned 70 last year and absolutely fell apart. Uh, Ended up with bradycardia, had to go get a pacemaker put in, and uh, I feel great. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but you know what? That's always going to be there. It's not going to go away, and it's very similar to aircraft. That age just impacts values. Engine hours, the closer you get to its recommended TBO, the less value. Well, that's pretty common sense. Equally important is to record consistent use coupled with good maintenance programs. If an engine sat for four years and never was cranked, do you expect it to still have all of its life left? And if you do, you're out of your ever-loving mind. They just don't do well when they aren't used. Nor do they do well when they were not overhauled correctly to begin with, or when they were overhauled with service limits instead of new limits. What's installed in it? Well, obviously we talked about that. What are the avionics in there? Older models getting newer avionics are always pretty good ideas. They certainly will aid them in value because you're gonna sell it fast. May not bring you as much money as you spent, but it's always gonna bring a better resale. Uh, old air conditioning, old de-icing gear really can impact the value of jets fast. All your records and airworthiness. And this is where I'm going to tell you guys keeping really good records, getting your logbooks in shape, making sure that all of the work done on that airplane is done properly, logged properly, input into your book properly, 337s filed. All of that impacts value down the pike. And you need to review the certificate, the engines, the airframe logbook, airframe equipment list, weight and balance, placards, FAA approved flight manual and owner's handbook. I saw somebody today looking for, our, for a uh, uh, one of the, I, I, I need the information on this airplane. And I'm going, you just bought it. Where's the, where's the owner's manual? Where, I mean, the, where, where's the pilot's owner's handbook? I mean, it's supposed to be in that aircraft. And if it's not, you aren't supposed to be flying it. Does everybody know that? I mean, that's critical. If you were to get ramp checked, I promise you they would slap you on the hands for not having that documentation. So missing documents, missing entries in logbooks can cause very significant problems for a buyer. Uh, unaware buyer may end up with one that really is not even airworthy and not even know it's not airworthy. Damage history. It always will decrease the value of an aircraft. How much depends on what the damage was. Type of accident, nature of the damage, who repaired it, how was it done, what major components were impacted, if at all. We, uh, they say pre-purchase inspectors should scrutinize that history to make sure it's properly re repaired in accordance with FAA regulations and recommended factors. One thing that this doesn't say is if it's a certified service center, they can put an entry in the logbook that said repaired this aircraft in accordance with factory drawings, such and such, factory engineering information, such and such. And that's all the paragraph's going to say. And when you go asking about that, you may find it was really severe damage to the airplane that they repaired with that one paragraph. Paint. New paint jobs will increase the value of an aircraft, but they got to be careful. The work could be just simply hiding corrosion under the surface. I'll get to one of those here in a little bit. And that can negatively affect value. Interiors that are in good condition and properly fit also enhance the value. And some may want to upgrade those interiors before they sell so that the colors and patterns match closely to the most recent trends and, and things. And 
doing that may actually lessen the time that the aircraft's on the market, but it may not return what the cost of that interior was. And that is just facts. Now, I'm going to get into some more facts up here. And I don't know if I can do this while I'm in here. Yeah, I can. This is an article written by Jeremy Cox of what's the impact of damage on aircraft value. We just talked about damage. But there are several different types of damage. There's actually non-deductible damage. In other words, a removable item, such as a wingtip or a surface got replaced, that there really was no other damage. In other words, the damage has been removed aircraft. There's no reason to make a deduction necessarily in the value of that aircraft for one of these replaceable parts that we've got a new part put back on it. However, in our case, where did you get a new flap? I don't think we can. So it's got to be a used one. So keeping track of where those parts came from are kind of important. Superficial damage, dings generally associated with hangar rash. They repaired by replacing a damage area with components. Maybe they actually put a new piece of aluminum on, down on it, uh, wingtip caps, wheel pants, all that sort of stuff. It may include skin change where an outer rib is slightly been or repaired or replaced. It really didn't involve anything major. It really didn't do any other damage. And that may have very little impact on the value. Then there's minor damage. Minor damage is heavy wear, say the leading edge where you had to replace the entire leading edge, a cowling uh, majorly damaged. Uh, but these parts were repaired in, in consistent manner with recommended procedures. How was it done? However, no structural components were involved in these minor incidents. A gear up landing where only skin changes were made is minor damage. It's never going to exceed that and it never should exceed that. If we had to replace structure, if we had to replace uh, your motor mounts, if we had to replace structural components down on the ribs and lower ends, crossovers, anything that went in there component-wise could push that into a moderate level or even major level. Extensive damage components not affecting any major structural components all fall within moderate damage. So you could have multiple ribs involved in a gear up and you'd want to evaluate that and get it evaluated correctly. Major damage, let's suppose somebody closes a hangar door on the tail of your aircraft and it gets cut in half and has a new tail put on it. Guess what? That's called major damage. And it is a big deal. Uh, anything involving a wing spar, anything involving a firewall, engine mount, uh, have to be done and have to be done with new or used serviceable components, have to be documented and you better start looking for the 337s. Although remember, server centers can get away without filing a 337 as long as they put that paragraph in there. And then there's some extensive major damage. I have seen several aircraft that really were put together from parts. They took a core and made one up. There is some subjectivity to it. Uh, individual mechanics oftentimes try to gloss over it. They try to hide it in a logbook entry. How extensive were they? You're better off to document it, document it correctly and get it in the book so that people know what was done because it might be minor. It actually is acceptable for an FAR 145 repair station to merely quote a work order reference number in a logbook. Believe it or not, I've seen one of these. 24 months later, they can destroy the work order file because that's all that's required to be kept. I don't rationalize that. I can't see that. And I did see it on an aircraft one time that had a strap across the belly of it, which I noticed wasn't normal for that particular aircraft. And when I was going through the logbook, I found one of these entries and it said, repaired aircraft section so-and-so uh, to station so-and-so in accordance with beach drawings such and such uh, and engineering uh, drawings such and such, see work order one, two, three, four, five for the uh, for information. That's all it did. And it was down at the bottom of a page in a small paragraph that was handwritten, hard to read. And I turned around and asked the uh, mechanic that was there with me, do you have that work order? And he said, I was afraid you'd find that. Oh, well, can I see it? 
I think it was 18 or 19 pages of work order there that we looked at. And I said, what did you fix? And he said, well, we found a crack across a fuselage through the pressure vessel behind the pilot seats. Now that's kind of a critical repair, don't you think? Here's a, here's a pressurized aircraft that's flying every day that had all of this work done to it and a one paragraph statement of what was done. When you look through the work order, you're going, holy mackerel, they basically had to rebuild this aircraft's pressure vessel, rebuild the outside skins and put a Band-Aid across it to hold the front and back together. That really impacts value a bit. And yet that was a legal entrance. Price guides, I love V-RIF, and he even mentions this, V-RIF and Aircraft Blue Book, they try to offer some very loose guidance on damage history. Get a damage table from V-RIF to diminish the value over time because the repair work becomes less questionable the more hours are put on the aircraft post-repair. That is somewhat true. The longer you go with an airplane that's been damaged against the time that it was done, the more likely it is that it was done quickly. The newer the damage, the more impact to the value that it has. Aircraft Blue Book comes up and says, aircraft that sustained damage in a lifetime will have diminished value. Difficult to assess the extent of value because so many variables must be considered. Most important for which is type of damage. Obviously, a grazed wing tips less serious, than, less serious than a gear up landing but also to be considered are the number of years it's been successfully flying since the damage was repaired, reputation of the shop that repaired it, and whether repairs were made to factor new or overhauled parts. I'll get into that in a second. Although Blue Book doesn't provide any percentage to apply against it, they recommend that, I recommend we use statements regarding missing logbooks. Well, that's interesting. Research indicates that any missing logbooks or any damage history will reduce an aircraft by as little as 10%, actually as little as two and a half percent, believe it or not. And you've got those incidentals that are with no impact value that have 0% damage, even though they are listed as damages, or it could get as much as 25. Truth is it could be as much as 50% in some cases. So it's very difficult for a book to evaluate that I find it interesting that VRIS says real minor damage needs to be a, needs to be appraised in order to get a particular value because it can be so minor that it really doesn't have any impact. Okay, what do you consider that to be? And they don't give you any guidance on how you figure that. They just tell you consult an appraiser. The bottom line of damage history, there's about 25 to 30% of people out there, and he said 20%, 20 to 25, Buyers just get put off by it. They just don't want any. And that's not, that's not minor inference. That's, that's a pretty major deal. This is one slide I want to show you. And this came from Charlie Bravo Aviation. Uh, it's got some charts. And what it's doing, I'm just going to go through it real quick. But it's a pretty good article on Asset quality, how maintenance impacts the value. This is one you need to be aware of. And I wanted you to be aware of this. Let's say you have an annual done. Okay, here's available maintenance. So the maintenance exposure means the longer it is used after the maintenance is done, the less the value of that maintenance was. That's true in some cases, not with annuals. I'm going to tell you, annual is... It, it does decrease over time because when you just had one done, you paid 1200 bucks for it, let's say. And it's due in 12 months. So a hundred bucks a month is what that number is gonna reduce by. Uh, if there's scheduled maintenance due, maintenance exposure decreases as the maintenance completed. So if you just did your thousand hour AD, obviously that AD is not due for another thousand hours. It's gonna have more more value than as you get closer to having to redo it, you get 500 hours, half of the value of that's gone. He gets down here and does a chart that I really like. And this is what I wanted to show you guys. Current flight hours on this particular airplane, and I did this wrong yesterday. I thought I was right, but I wasn't. Current flight hours on this airplane are 3,050 and the current cycles are 2,500 
and it's been in service for 120 months. <clears throat> this aircraft only has a few limits, five limiters on it. There are more than limiters on a Comanche and there's more limiters in that on all business jets. Some of them are several pages, but he did this for an example. In this case, at 100 flight hours, you have to do this event one inspection. So every 100 hours, you do this event one. It was last completed at 3,000 flight hours and next due is at 3,100 flight hours. So how much of it remains when he's got 30, 50 on it? 50 hours. So only 50% of the economic life of the thousand dollar cost of that hundred hour event only leaves you $500 in equity for that service being done. Event two. Now I will tell you this impacts jets and turbines more than, more than our aircraft, but it does impact all aircraft, very similar method. Uh, event two is every 75 cycles you have to do a $750 cycle inspection. Now, this was last completed on this one at 2,475 cycles. The next one's due at 2,550 cycles. So 66% of that still remains and the current equity is $502.25. Event three calls for a 12 month period. The next due is 12 months. Therefore, 100% of its remaining life is there. It costs $2,000, but notice over to the right side, the equity value of that $2,000 is only a thousand bucks. So half of that expense is all you're gonna get back in equity. Event four, 600 hour, was last completed at 3,000 hours. It's next due at 3,600 hours. So basically at 3050, he's got 91.7% of a $6,000 event but his equity is only 5502. Then you got event five that's an 1800 hour inspection and this could be for a turbine engine half-life. It was last completed at 1800 hours. The next one's due at 3600 hours. If you look up, he's got 30, 50 hours on it. So only 30% remains. It's an $18,000 event. The current equity is only 5508. Next two items he put on there, exterior paint and interior refurbishment. In this particular airplane, it was never done. It's never been repainted. It's never been refurb and it's due and he's going now. What's it gonna cost to do? He said 10,000 and 15,000. So therefore the current equity is zero and zero because they are due, they gotta have it. The maximum maintenance available equity is 52,750. Now let me put a number to this, out of that 52,750 of what these events cost, how much of it is gonna be available in equity to this particular airplane? Well, if I total up the right-hand column, it's only $13,000. If I were to have all of these at zeros, it would have an equity value of 2613. So the aircraft in this particular case is short $13,000 worth of value because of these items not being accomplished. If I repainted it, would I get it all back? No, it looks like I'd only get about half of it back. Doesn't it? And that's information that you need to understand in equity value of maintenance. It is not the full value of what you just paid. I constantly have people saying, and you just appraised my airplane and you didn't give me but $900 for an annual I just had done three months ago. And I paid $10,000 for that annual. And I have to explain that, no, you really didn't pay $10,000 for the annual. You paid 1200 for the inspection. All of the rest of that was to keep your aircraft airworthy. Tell me where I'm wrong. And sometimes they'll come back and say, well, yeah, we did have to overhaul this and we did have to overhaul that because it wasn't working right. The gear motor was shot and that circuit breaker was bad and this was bad and that was bad and we had to do this and they found some hoses that were shot. Does that increase the value of the airplane by the amount of the maintenance he just had done? And the answer is partially, but not all of it. In fact, in this particular case, when we got through with it, it was about 30% of it is 10,000, about $3,000 came back in in work that would have had to have been done had it not have been done and it would reduce the value. Well, that's what I have for presentation wise. I've got a couple other ones up here. 
I was gonna show you that if you need an appraiser, you can go to appraisaplane.biz and get a appraiser locator. You can sign up for the free tool. And I did this earlier, putting a demo in there so that I can sign in and get up and it'll ask you to sign up for your, for your demonstration. Once you get that in there, you can log in and actually use the appraiser finder uh, and, and log in to the locator tool. I don't know if that's going to remember me or not, but let's see if it does. It didn't. Sorry about that. Well, I can't show you that, but it, when you pull in the locator, I'm on a different computer than I normally use. When you pull in that locator, you can find one uh, by airport code, by zip code, by whatever criteria you want to put in there to search by, and you'll find several listings for all of them that are anywhere near you. Uh, I recommend that, that you do that. Anyway, I'm open to questions at this point, if uh, anybody has any. Uh, and Pete, you can take it back if you want. One of the things we uh, we mentioned and last night when we were talking was that uh, you know, if you if you want to ask Tracy to give him a, give you a ballpark figure on any particular airplane, he cannot do that. Don't even bother asking. But if you want to figure out how to find out, that that's a different question. And Tracy, uh, thank you so much. A couple of things. One is um, that. The story of the Mooney with the paint bubbles. <laughs> um, that is quite the story. And uh, I have I lost connection with the Zoom for a few minutes. So I'm gonna, usually I'll go into the chat window where I, we've asked everybody to put your questions and comments. And when I get wiped out, I lose that chat history. So I'm gonna turn that back over to Pete Morse to go into the chat window and look for the comments and questions. And Pete will, do the same thing I do, just read them out to Tracy and uh, completely, and then ask the question or whatever that answers the question. Is that all right Actually, with you, Pete? I'll pull them up. Oh, okay, great. The I'll big thing, them. Tracy, is we have people who have dialed in. Right. Um, and so you'll need to read the question in full, and that way the people dialed in can, and, uh, can and, hear and it. I, I wish Pat Kiefer had joined us, but I'm sorry about the open mic problem, but uh, I'm glad to have her here. Um, and she was here earlier. Yeah, let me scan on down. Uh, what about when there aren't any market like the 400? Eh, that's an interesting question. There are markets for 400, and uh, I know of three of them for sale right now. So to answer the question, besides that, it is a Comanche first of all and a 400 second of all. So yeah, they can be evaluated because what makes that Comanche 400 different than a Comanche 250 that gets a 720, uh, Iowa 720 put in it? The answer is the engine is the only major difference when you boil it down to airframe versus accessories. And I know that isn't going to go over well with some of the 400 people because, well, geez, we've got the twin tail and we've got this and we've got that. I get it. But the truth is the market is the market and there are plenty of them around to evaluate the market like that. Um, so yeah, there are. Uh, ta -ta -bum -bum. Let me see what else. Mine, Canada, there's 400s again, we're going down. I'm trying to scroll down and see there. Uh, switch the logarithms, you'll do better. <laughs> uh, yes, you can, it can indeed. Hi, right, Pat, I'm glad you're still here. I hope it was interesting to you. I think she knows more about Comanches than I do in most cases. Um, okay, so other than the 400, was there any other questions I'm missing here? Raise your hand, speak up. Robert's got his hand up, Robert K. Hey, Robert. Uh, yes, is there any, any particular upgrade that, although people might like to do it, it has the least value in terms of you get back maybe 10% of what you put in as opposed to 40 or 50%. No, that's a real good one. Um, 
and I don't know, I don't know of any that would return that low of a return on investment. Uh, I will say having your seat belts rewebbed when you should be doing a shoulder harness upgrade is kind of dumb. I mean, things like that aren't going to return the value that you spend on, on getting seat belts rewebbed. Whereas if you go ahead and upgrade the shoulder harnesses, you're going to get a good portion of that back. So there are some things you are doing maintenance wise that may not return you as much value as you might. I'll give you an example of one. Let's suppose for a second that you have a belly in. And here's, here's a real good one for you. Let's suppose you belly in, you bent the prop, and you're going to have that engine checked. The engine's got 1,500 hours on it. If you don't overhaul it and pay the difference for that overhaul versus a teardown inspection, you are nuts. Why do I say that? It's really quite simple. When they do a teardown inspection, they've got to open that case. They've got to get in and look at all of the bearings, and bushings, and cranks, and blower, and everything else. They've got it open to do an, to do a complete overhaul while they're in there. That's not cheap to get them opened up. And if you got 1,500 hours on the engine, just getting it inspected and put back together and said, okay, it's good to go, leaves you a... 1500 hour engine i don't care what all the expense was that went into it if you add a little bit more money with that expense you have a fully overhauled engine that would be crazy maintenance that makes sense yes it does thank you i'm not going to get off this easy emma Tracy, there's a there's a couple more questions that have come in to the okay. chat window. And in addition to that, you told me a story that I think you should relay about uh, the Mooney with the fresh paint. <laughs> let me tell you. Yeah, I had years ago, I had a gentleman ask me to go look at a Mooney for him that he had found and he was interested in getting hold of. And he said, it's up there uh, uh, at a location near, near you. So I went up to look at it. And in looking at it, I see that it had been a particular flying magazine, and I don't mean flying in itself, but a different magazine had done an overhaul on it and cleaned it up and added avionics and made it into a much newer aircraft and done all this sort of stuff. And I thought, well, that's pretty good, man. That should add value to it. And I get out and start looking at the airplane, and, and uh, one of the notes in the log showed that about three months ago it had been repainted. Uh, and, and I thought, well, good, they're, they're at least maintaining this thing and getting it right. I get out and I'm looking at the airplane and all of a sudden I'm seeing bubbling it under the paint. Uh, that's a little strange. Three months ago it got done and all of a sudden it's, it's got cruciform showing up under the paint already. That, that's kind of scary. What's going on? In looking up in the wheel wells, I'm seeing areas that really look terrible. I mean, they should have polished them out or done something with them because they really look bad. Uh, looking at the inspecting the gear real close, you could see where there were some rusted parts of the gear even still showing. So the paint job was masking all of this. And I told the guy he really needed to get a close inspection done on this airplane because I can't see inside. I can't tell what's going on in there. And it needs a good pre-buy. And since it was here in Texas, he uh, he got it taken down to uh, Kerrville. I'll be honest. Took it down to Kerrville. And Kerrville did a pre-buy on it and told him it needed $70,000 worth of work. I'm just telling you, that's what it needed to be airworthy in the first place. And they said, I wouldn't even fly it back to Fort Worth if I were And he Surprise. did purchase it? No, he did not. For no. whatever <laughs> reason, I don't. The airplane wasn't, the asking price on the airplane was more than it should have been in the first place. And it was 72 or 73,000 at the time. If it needs 70,000 dollars worth of work, it's a $2,000 airplane. It's just that simple. Uh, and obviously it wasn't going to get sold for $2,000, but uh so you're saying it's got a chance. Yeah, well, it, <laughs> the guy that did buy it paid way too much for it. And I, it, it was a, and, and I didn't get involved in it beyond the initial appraisal, but I do know the guy that did end up buying that airplane and spent four years trying to put it back in the air. 
Wow. True statement. Uh, I don't know how much. Well, Tracy, it's a little I, I, better if you know what you're getting into. Yeah, it helps. Uh, well, <laughs> well uh, just to read off a couple um, of questions, uh, <laughs> the Comanches have increased in value this past year. What are the key drivers? Well, the first one I'm going to point you to is called the stock market. Did it increase in value over the last year as well? And the fact is, yep. And you know, it's funny how things follow markets. And the stock market is oftentimes in aircraft sales a key indicator of what's going on with aircraft values. When that goes up, sales go up, values go up. When sales go down, values come down. So what went up can come down real fast as well. I'm just saying. Uh, but the market has been a, one of the key indicators. The second one is we're finally coming out of all of these and we're finally getting vaccines and everything else out of the COVID and aircraft sales picked up. In fact, major biz jet sales picked up more than they have in years over the last three months. And the inventories are dropping to incredibly low levels uh, for those airplanes, which brokers are going nuts over. They're going, wait a minute, I don't have inventory. I need, I need to get inventory. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the overall market's been real good. And, and that pushes prices up when, when the market goes up. Uh, is that the total driver? No, I think some people are getting back to flying that had put it off. Some people got rid of airplanes prior to uh, prior to time, and now they're getting back in. So it's just a good good market at this point in time. So all aircraft values gone up, not just Comanches. Not just Comanches. Well, you want to be scared? Look at one seventy twos. I I am shocked, and and it's a bubble. It's a bubble due to training flights, due to schools not being able to get inventory uh, or afford a new 172, so they're buying everything up on the marketplace. And that's pushed 172s into the stratosphere where they do not belong. So yeah, there's values going up all over the place. And I, I, I see 70 model 172s advertised for $100,000 and just have to choke myself and laugh. I don't get it. It ain't worth it, okay? Don't do it. But they're selling because schools are getting a lot of new pilot interest, and that's good news because there's going to be a shortage. Yeah. And uh, going down the list, this is very helpful, and we had talked last night about the emergence of three autopilots, and that leads right into Mike Ellis's question, what avionics get the best payback? Yeah, it's, you know, if you look back a few years, the only real options you had for autopilots and Comanches were for Mestec or, or uh, uh, who am I thinking of? Sentry. And, uh, and of course, Sentry was the old, old autopilots and Pipers, or actually the Piper autopilot. I don't know. Anyway, there's a, yeah, it's Edo, the Edo Air got sold to Sentry, and Sentry, but it's, it's, it's such a convoluted uh, background. <laughs> that I don't even keep it straight all the time. Um, but Sentry and STEC were the only two that really had viable autopilots for any of our airplanes. And quite honestly, they knew it and they said, ha ha, we can charge outrageous amounts for these stupid things and those Comanches because we've got STCs and nobody else does. Um, and these are what we're gonna charge for. So your, your STECs and, and uh, Sentries were fairly high dollar to put in those airplanes. Now that you've got some competition coming in, they're, all, they're both going, you know what? If we want to really sell autopilots into these things, we're gonna have to come down and find a way to get better value into what we're selling. Uh, and the 3100 came out uh, and it's a great autopilot. I mean, I don't argue with STEC on the 3100. It's a nice autopilot. Uh, but you now have some much lower priced uh, options to that. And that's going to continue to help us because is Trio or the new, what, what is that King just bought out or yeah, Bendix King just bought out one of them. Uh, is it going to be a worse autopilot than a 3100? And the answer is kind of wait to be seen. The 3100, you know, was built by Aztec. The, the servos are probably, servos have been in use for years. So they probably have some pretty good experience behind them. 
but that helps the market and it helps our airplanes from a practicality standpoint that makes them better. Um, you know, autopilots are lifesavers. It, they just are. And the more of our airplanes that have those, the more market you're going to pick up because people using them for long distance travel are going to be more interested in having uh, Joe sitting there flying that thing while I'm looking at my chart. And we all know we can get into trouble real fast if we've got our heads down looking at a chart and flying instruments. I do anyway. I mean, I, I can get dizzy in a hurry. Oh, wait, my wife says I am dizzy. Never mind. Uh, you guys are still married. <laughs> really huh, good. 72 to now. Yeah, I can't believe she's put up with me that long. Well done. Hi. Can I ask something? Oh, hang on. I'm going to shut him up. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Didn't mean to have um, a ringing phone in everybody's ear. Not at all. There's a few questions down, and then Adam, if you want to toss it into the chat window, or we can call on you as soon as I've done the list in the chat window. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure if you could hear me on Hicks. Mike doesn't know me what. Loud and clear. Um, so autopilots, any other key uh, avionics that really are things we should consider? I'm looking, if we're at, I'm looking, looking to... at Michael's uh, panel back behind him here going, you know, that's an ideal panel for a, uh, uh, for a Comanche. Glass has come down in price, folks. If you look back just a few years ago, if you wanted a glass panel in an airplane, you're going to spend more than your Comanche cost. That is no longer true. And it does an improvement that absolutely increases sales value. But besides that, it will increase how long that thing will, or decrease how long that thing will sit on the market for itself. And it's worth doing with, particularly with the new Garmin pieces, uh, the G5 type series, 275s, uh, even the GX3s are, are very, very nice panels and are certainly worth considering. Now, that being said, if you expect to get that back, um, got a rude awakening for you, you won't. Typically, you'll get back about 75% of what the equipment cost is when you put it in. That's right after you put it in. A year from now, that'll be down a little more. A year after that, a little more. A year after that, a little more. But just like computers, the price is coming down on that stuff. Electronics are getting cheaper, and as that transpires, they get better in most cases, but because they're getting cheaper, the older stuff also has to get cheaper. So will you get it all back? Maybe, maybe not. You're not going to get it all back because you're going to spend more on installation in many cases than the equipment cost, and that's just reality. If you expect to see the installation cost back, you've got a different problem. It just doesn't really happen. Well, yeah, I've got a son about a store and head home. Um, oh, stand by one. Uh, sorry, uh, just uh, let's see. A question about composites. Um, are composites discounted because of expiration dates? That's from um, Will Gibson, in case you want to clarify. Are composites yes and no? Uh, yes, they are. There are time limited things. I, you know, the 10 year, uh, what is that to do the 10 year parachute, like on a S22, I think. Uh, it's what, 12 grand? I think it's about 12,000 to replace the rockets and put a new parachute in that thing every 10 years. And yeah, you know, the closer you get to the 10 year point, that 12,000 is, is a decreasing value it wasn't ever 12000 to begin with, and now you've got, you're faced with a $12,000 extent. And composites do have the same life limit. When we talk about life limits, it usually applies more to jets and turbines than it does to single engine airplanes. But with composites, there are life limits on the, on the wing structures, on some of those other structures that have to be taken into account and have to be evaluated. So yes. They do decrease. I need to get going, but I got all. I'm sorry, did he disappear? 
sorry about that. Nope, I had some background noise, so I was trying to mute so I wasn't taking over the meeting. Oh. <laughs> um, yep, and so the uh, <laughs> what um, there was a question from Serge, which was really interesting. What about upgrades that would lower the value? Trying to think of what one would be that that would impact our airplanes. What's an upgrade that would lower the value? <laughs> That's called a down. And Serge, actually, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. You asked that, and and I and I totally escaping my mind at the moment. But let's let's back up to the turbine market for a minute. Do you realize when you go to a G one thousand panel in a King Air, and we'll back up several years here. Those panels were what, $450,000 to have all of your analog instruments replaced with a G1000 panel under an STC. When you did that, you actually lost value in the avionics because the old avionics that were in there are dadgum expensive crap. I'm sorry, I use that word, but I'm going to tell you they are expensive. And now they are that word, uh, but they're still expensive to maintain. And the minute you put that G1000 in, this $900,000 worth of avionics package you had is now only $450,000. So can you get into that scenario? And the answer is yes and no. It's not likely to happen in, our, in, in, in Comanches, but it can happen in aircraft. You can indeed uh, reduce a valuable item uh, and put in a cheap item and get away with it and it will reduce the value of the aircraft. Uh, avionics are maybe one area we have to watch closely because as they come down in price, what you paid yesterday is no longer relevant. Yeah. Serge, did that did you have anything in particular in mind? Or did that get to your question? Oh, I was just wondering if, if I did the like if certain upgrades were either poorly installed or placement isn't ideal or certain color choices aren't that great and all stuff that would I did a Serge I did a uh, 172 several years ago for a guy whose wife had picked out the fabric for the interior and it looked like his living room couch it had big flowers I mean it was just awfully colored I mean it, and yes that did indeed lower the value of that airplane because somebody's going to have to redo that interior we kind of touched on that back with that slide where we were talking about interior and paint that airplane needed to be repainted and re-interiored to have any market value because it ain't going to sell the way it sits. Or if it does, it's somebody that's colorblind and they shouldn't be flying anyway, I'll put it that way. Or had a very poor taste. But yes, you can do that. And you're, at, you're talking about installation. You notice I did mention quality earlier. I've seen avionics hung by owners and it scares me to death because they don't know how to wire. They got wire running everywhere and they shouldn't. And it's it scares me. I mean, seriously, because this is a poor installation. You know you're going to have to redo it. So, of course, the value is reduced because what we look at is how much is it going to cost to repair what has to be repaired. And we see owner installed stuff that has to come back out and be redone properly. Yeah, there's an impact of value. So, yes, in the quality of an installation does matter. We look at interiors, we look at the seams, we look at the materials, we look at how those seams are straight done, whether the padding was recorrected, whether this and that and the other. There are just a lot of things that can go wrong if you go cheap. And uh, pay attention to that because you, you can go cheap on your airplane and pay for it in the long run. Well, that was a great question from Serge then yeah. because uh, we we like to wrench on our own airplanes, a lot of us. So do it right. Uh, um, a question from uh, Bill. Uh, what is the general situation with an aircraft that has been exposed to water? That, that, that has possible uh, corrosion. Ooh. And okay. it's been put, Thanks for the clarification. And it has been put in, back into airworthy. Uh, certification. Well, there's the reality of it, Bill, is there's very few buyers going to want to buy it. As a result, its value is shrunk immensely. As to how far, it depends on 
who who did the corrosion repair and how did they do it and what did they do to mitigate all of that water most airplanes that have been in the water for any length of time at all hit the salvage market because they're not worth putting back in the air that's sad but it's a fact because you can't fix salt water that an airplane sat in for six months. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Phil, did, did you want to ask the question about what if it just uh, washed through? Well, I, and I, then recite. Yeah. I think Tracy kind of put the whole thing in a perspective there. Is that the moment you talk about possible corrosion, there's an overreaction to it regardless of how you have cleaned it up or done anything with it. Yeah, what did they do to mitigate it? You know, did they, you know, Comanche's well, obviously zinc, zinc primated and it's got, it's got good, good coating to help protect from that. Well, Once that's gone, then you've got a problem with it. And if it didn't have that, what did they do to assure that, that what they cleaned out and got out isn't going to come back? And if well, they did it right, you might be okay with it. Well, the thing is, I think the moment you mentioned the possibility of corrosion, and it is in the logbook, okay, <clears throat> that uh, people are going to overreact. I know at the airport, when Florence hit here, 22 airplanes were total. Yeah. Okay. My airplane happened to be just for landing gear and the lower part of the belly. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> the uh, if you're familiar with the command, you've seen my whole the whole area where the fuel pump is had no corrosion at all. But I think the thought that the thought that there was co corrosion and what have you, people people overreact to it. Yeah, and that's I I don't know how you erase that, Bill. It's it's mm -hmm. you know it's damage history that's there. It's fact that it's there, and people's minds are people's minds. Uh, some will, some will not worry about it. Some will be con highly concerned, and and it will impact the value. Uh, but the right buyer may or may ignore it. So that's it, a tough one to answer. But yeah, there's an impact there, and it will never go away. One of the reasons the insurance company total them out for that. I mean, you know, they don't know what a thing's going to be worth once it's out. Uh, yeah, it's mm -hmm. like on your landing gear. Did you replace the gear, or did they just clean it up? Well, uh, that, they're in the process of, of doing that now, and all we really have to do is clean clean it up thoroughly and then put ATF on it. Yeah. Well, if they would replace it with new components, then you don't have the corrosion issue. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, you know. The belly, mm -hmm. the belly, you'll never get it cleaned out. But if you if you replace a gear with one that has not been in the water, you don't have this, you mitigated it totally. It wasn't ever in the water. Mm -hmm. If you leave it on there, it's been in the water. So you got to put that risk down there. But I, I mm -hmm. get it, and I get the question. Uh, I'm following. Thank you. A good one um, from Hank. Uh, what is the cost, high to low? Of an appraisal, uh, and on what does the variation depend? Where are you located, Hank? Eric. <laughs> the, you know, it, it's Central Illinois. Central yeah. Illinois. You're probably you're probably in mid mid ground there. Yeah, uh, well, and specifically to Comanche, you know, not not anything other than Comanche. I will I would say they vary depending on the market location and what it costs for the guy to be in business in that location. Uh, midpoint on them is around five, 600 bucks at the low ends and probably 1200 on the higher ends. Um, it's almost like doing a pre-buy other than, uh, other than it's more research than it is uh, mechanical inspection. We're not looking to do a mechanical inspection. We look at the log books and if, uh, if a, AIAP signed off an annual on that thing. He's the one with it. He's the one that's responsible for that annual. Now we have found them where we find these paper annuals being done, and and report it in the in the report and ding it for that because 
sometimes it's quite obvious that really did not have any repair work done. It really didn't have an annual inspection done. Uh, I bought a, the twin Comanche I bought, I bought out in California, uh, from a guy and flew it back here. And when we got it back here, we looked and for 10 years of his, uh, the time he owned it for, I think he owned it 20 something years for 10 years of those, he was getting paper annuals and you could tell it real fast. Uh, my AI that I took out there with me to look at it and I both knew that. So when we got it back, we knew we'd have to go through some things. But one of the key points was the Bendix mags that were supposedly uh, had the ADs done, never were stamped and never were changed and never had an AD put on them. And for 10 years, here's a guy signing off an annual inspection on it. Now, should he go to jail? My opinion, yeah, the FAA ought to pull his ticket, but they probably won't. And we didn't really care. But you have to watch out for things like that. And uh, it does matter. Uh, what is the high and low? Like I said, uh, you might find somebody that, that that's eager and hungry and they haven't done any work for a while. So they'll do it for 400 bucks or something, but you know, typically you're going to pay, you're going to, you're going to get them for between six and 12, maybe even 1500 in some location. If I was in California, I'd be charging $8,000 for each one of them. No, I'm kidding. I have to pay the taxes and the rent to live out there. I, I think I might be a little higher. Texas, I don't have that kind of taxes and rent, so it's not bad. <laughs> so everybody fly your airplanes you to go. Texas because no. it's a good uh, trip. You can also go to Oklahoma <laughs> and get paint jobs done for a lot less than you can in a lot of other places too. That is a good point. Um, and everybody, we have a group by special that just uh, got negotiated with uh, on paint and and I won't take the time of this group here, but if you have a paint shop that you love, uh, message us because we can explain what the paint shop process was that allowed them to say, you know what, if a group of you come in, we can actually cut you a pretty good break and still make money at our end um, and not cover up nasty corrosion like in the Mooney <laughs> that Tracy mentioned. Uh, so some other questions that have come in, um, and this has to do with a lot of questions about avionics and autopilot. Yeah that are interesting. That. So with respect to the fact that there's several autopilots that are going to come online soon for the Comanche, right. including, you know, long names like the Aztec, uh, you know, very high end names like the Garmin GFC 500, and then uh, good, but coming over to the experimental market, the Trio Pro Pilot, when appraising the autopilot, how much value is related to the manufacturer and how much is related to just having an autopilot? Well, just having an autopilot doesn't really answer the question of what's the value of that particular autopilot now, does it? You, Absolutely right. You, you've got to look at you, you've got to look at the market itself and what people are willing to pay. Am I going to pay more for an Aztec autopilot to put it in in the first place? And the answer, of course, I am. Is it going to be worth more when it's in the airplane than than the Trio or one of the others? Um, yes, it will be because they were less than ten thousand dollars, and it was over twenty. You know, uh, does it make a difference? Yeah. And the fact is, the equipment values are based on uh, the equipment values. Over time, that may change. You know, but, but if if I if I put in a five thousand dollar air conditioner in my home versus a $20,000 air conditioner in my home. Is there a difference in market value of my home? And the answer is yes. How much depends. And over time won't be that much. So yeah, there is a difference. Uh, and to answer the question, I, uh, is S tech better than Garmin? No, I don't think so, but it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. So its value will probably be slightly higher for a while until people get used to the fact Garmin has a better or as good an autopilot, and then that may reverse itself. So it's a good question. So you might get a slight bump on that Garmin. Yeah, yeah. it's a good question. I mean, I, I, yes, known autopilots will, for a while, carry more value and in, in weight than, than just having an autopilot. <laughs> Yeah, and I so, and then uh, you got it. Okay, 
So I see one that says, whatever you on, get the best payback, autopilot, glass, GPS. Yes. All of the- And throw in the diamond there. Yeah, I see yeah. the diamond down there. Um, you know, bang for the buck, it depends on what your point is with, with improving your airplane. Are you wanting to get the usability out of it? Are you wanting to get the value out of it? If you're looking for value, get another hobby for Pete's sake. <laughs> I mean, seriously, back in the 80s, we could buy airplanes, improve them, and make money on them. That is never going to be the case again, I don't think. Could be, but I don't think so. I don't think it's coming to that anymore. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, I bought airplanes and improve them a little bit and sell them and make money on every one of them, even though I kept them three or four years. Uh, what avionics get the best payback? They all are going to cost you more put in than you are going to get back. Is there a best payback? Glass at the moment is probably the best payback for the buck, but it's still limited to a percentage of what the expense is of putting it in. Autopilots are always welcome and going to help that airplane sell faster because it has one. Uh, do they care what type? Well, the type that you put in is going to impact value, but it's but an autopilot being in it is going to help it sell faster. Just, that's reality. And if you've got an inoperative autopilot, getting it out of there is also going to help you get more money because if I have the expense of having to remove one, uh, that's that's an expense I've got to face as a, as a buyer. And uh, that's the thing to, to pay attention to. Uh, GPS, I'll be honest, these days, if you don't have a GPS in your airplane, I don't care what you paid for it, you ain't getting the airplane sold. Does that make sense? Wow. I'm just saying, if, if I've got the option of two airplanes, this one's got GPS and that one doesn't, and they're all within a couple of thousand bucks of each other, which one am I going to buy? Yep. And I'm just saying, if it doesn't have if it doesn't have GPS, it really is going to have trouble in the marketplace. It it'll sell, but it's going to take you longer, and you're going to have to compete against those that do have it. I think that was an eye opener for everybody. Um, how, uh, let's see, <laughs> there's the request for, so we've kind of, there's, the, there's a whole bunch of questions just trying to figure out whether Garmin, uh, if you go with all Garmin versus, you know, an Avidine with an Aspen, is it going to make much of a difference in your, in your sense or is it more the basic capabilities of I've got a GPS, I've got an autopilot, that's a two axis digital. And we've already answered that the Aztecs and probably the Garmin's will command a um, just by basis by by dint of being like Kleenex versus Joe Schmo tissue paper but for a yeah. while until the names get known or they get old. Yeah. But is there a general sense when you go and you're doing appraisals on an older airplane? Does it make a lot of difference, or is it more the fundamental capability? Well. Of being able to tick the box for I GPS. Think it's, I think that's asking a question that is very difficult for an appraiser to answer because we look at it from a value standpoint. What's the value of this airplane? How do they stand up? Uh, well, how do they stand up on the cost factor when you put them in? Is Aspen cheaper? Is it more expensive? Is Garmin cheaper or is it more expensive? And if you don't look at that when you're buying to put them in, you're missing part of valuation common sense. The better the panel is all the way around, the more market value it's going to have. Does that mean a G1000 is worth more than a GX3? And the answer is, well, yeah, because it was installed at the factory and it wasn't just an upgrade later on. Does that mean the GX3 is not worth it? Not at all, because look how much less expensive that is. And if you had tried to put a G1000 into an existing aircraft, you'd have to go get STCs and all the other stuff in order to retrofit because that's sold only for new aircraft. How do Aspen stack up? they are less expensive and therefore they're going to be less value in the marketplace. It's just that simple. The cheaper 
the avionics get, the cheaper all of it becomes in the marketplace. And there's no way to make that make that different. If I pay five thousand dollars for a radio versus two thousand dollars for a radio, is the five thousand dollar radio worth more? Might be, might not be. It all depends on how well they hold up. It all depends on the manufacturers still in business. Uh, an old Narco Mark 12D is a great radio when they're working. Now break it. How much is it worth? Not a lot when you can't get it fixed. And the same thing goes for, for all of the glass that's out there is what's going to hold up, what's going to hold value, what's going to, which manufacturer is going to be around to support it. And I can't answer any of those questions. I don't have a crystal ball, but I will tell you that based on the initial cost factors, is what you need to be concerned with. You're only going to get back around, the minute you put it in, you're only going to get back around 75% of the actual equipment costs in value. A bit like driving a car Absolutely off a lot. Absolutely positive. Or putting a big swimming pool in your house. Once it's done and you pay that- painful 50, moments. Once you've done and you pay that $50,000 bill for the swimming pool, it's worth maybe 20. So as one of the posters that's, said, do it for yourself. That, and that's, Enjoy, I mean, that, do what you like. We, we like these airplanes. We want to make them the best we can. Enjoy it. And yes, realize that it's not going to return everything you put into it. Uh, a question from Pat Kiefer. He said, this is extremely interesting. And when you appraise, is the plane normally flown or no. pre-flight run up? In fact, we don't even operate any switches. I tell the guys, if you're appraising an airplane, don't turn the switches off and on. You'll be accused of leaving it on and running a battery down. Get the mechanic or the owner to operate any avionics you want turned on. Uh, look for any logbook entries that say they weren't well. But no, we don't fly them and we don't do a pre-flight run up or any of that. It's strictly a visual I call it a really, really hard pre-flight uh, walk around and a book review and uh, then a market review of what, what we saw, what we see. Pat. So, no, we shouldn't. Now, in your case, if you need me to pre-flight it for you or fly it, I'd be more than happy to, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's some history there, I can tell. <laughs> um, interesting. So, and you're saying if the owner requests, or not the owner, the prospective purchaser requests, you'll, would you, uh, if the mechanic or the owner or the owner's agent was there to actually do the operation, is it something that uh, a person requesting an appraisal could have done that you would, well, as knowledgeable I would owners never, put in? I would ordinarily not, I, I wouldn't fly one. I really wouldn't. Uh, and I wouldn't let, I mean, if the owner wants to take me up for a ride and then says, I don't really want you to take a ride in this thing, see how great it is. Uh, I, I've turned that down twice on airplanes. I wouldn't get in to fly. I mean, I'll, I'll just be honest. I've been across them. And I'm like, yeah, no, I don't think so, but I appreciate the offer. Uh, for a pre-flight run up, if, if you just have had routine service done on them, I can't tell much from a pre-flight run-up. I really can't from a value standpoint. What matters is what's in those log books. What matters is a condition that shows the thing's been cared for and taken care of. And when it didn't do a good pre-flight run-up, it was taken in and the spark plugs were cleaned or replaced or whatever work was needed to be done. So really uh, a visual examination of the prop uh, on a Occasion, I might open a cowling and look in, but very rarely. Uh, we, we depend on the mechanic's life that signed off on those re inspections. And he depends on it too. So there's reason the books matter. And, and that's just my, my personal. Are there appraisers that would? Oh, I'm sure. But we, we caution them against yeah. doing it because there's, there's issues there. Can be. Yeah. And I'm gonna, uh, Adam's trying to ask a question um, and I'll res resume to return to the chat. I think this is about right in the sequence. Adam, over to you. So, 
Can you guys hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Loud and clear. Okay. Um, my, my question mainly was, you mentioned about substantial repairs. Now, how do you value the full nut and bolt restorations in the way that like Gino is doing, where they strip the plane down completely to its parts and then rebuilt the plane? Here's my question for before. Gino. Here's no. my question for Gino. And, and I don't know him. I really don't. It, does he have the authorization to be doing that sort of repair work on that airplane? I think so. Does he, CJ? I, um, I don't know, CJ, if Gino is a mechanic or not. I, uh, I'm, I'm ignorant. Uh, Gino is quite, quite knowledgeable, but uh, he's doing a very, very extensive uh, restoration. My so I don't know. Is, there are limits to owner manufactured parts, folks. So the reason I ask that, obviously, is because those restorations, when they actually go onto the market, they tend to sell for $120,000, $130,000 at top dollar because they're as close as you can get to a new Comanche. But you would see that in the appraisal it world would, as just extensive repairs. Yeah, it would raise a question, and I'll give you an example of that. It would raise a question to me of how was that restoration done, mm. seriously? Where were the molds that he used to form this stuff? I mean, yeah. I know the original molds were flooded out in 1972 and no longer available for a Comanche. So how did he do the forging and how was it done and was it done in the materials that were approved by the original type certificate? So it would all depend. And I got to tell you, I think there's some questions there that may indeed reduce the value of that airplane, not increase it. Hmm. Somebody mentioned the Bailey bullet earlier. I know I mentioned it earlier and somebody said, well, what was wrong with it? Well, the price is it was way overpriced. But the second thing is he put so many odd mods in that thing that nobody's going to pay for them. It was utterly ridiculous. Uh, I mean, it wasn't utterly ridiculous. It was really neat, but, but the value of, of what he was trying to sell was probably about half of what he wanted to sell it for. And the markups become extreme at that point. Yeah, what I will say about Gino is if he gets it all done and done right, he will never recoup his own time back. I think he's doing it for the love of it, just like we all do. I was just curious about what And I doing. have no problem with that. Yeah. Where I do have a problem is a father and son group out in a state I won't mention bought a Mooney that had been parked for 33 years. Now, they're in the automotive business. They repair cars own a body shop, no aircraft experience, whatever. They bought this Mooney that had been parked for 33 years because, well, it was a bargain, man. I mean, it was a real bargain. I could get it and not pay a whole lot for it. We got it, took the wings off of it, brought it back to their auto shop and started working on it to put it back together right. Now, I have a question. Who did the work? Who signed off the work? Absolutely nobody other than these two guys put it back together. Then they go and get it an annual. And some nut job did an annual on it and signed it as airworthy. And I'm sorry, but these guys had way beyond what is considered owner authorized maintenance done with never filing any 337s. They didn't even know what one was. They installed all the avionics without ever doing a 337 because they didn't know what one was. Was it installed right? Well, our appraiser looked down under the dash and looked back up in there and found all of the automotive wiring that was used on those avionics. Now, my question is, when I go down to Radio Shack, which no longer exists, and I buy wire and put it in my airplane, is that approved wiring to even be in an airplane in the first place and is that going to impact the value of that thing when that appraisal got through that airplane was worth five thousand dollars less than what they paid for this airplane had been parked 33 years mainly because all of the work that they would have to do to get the work that they did do approved and they were never going to get some of that approved because some of the things they did were not even legal be aware you can you can get yourself into trouble with your owner assisted maintenance or your owner done maintenance if you're not following rules and i don't know the answer to to your question i don't want to interrupt you go okay. ahead no nope <laughs>
<laughs> that's just somebody who's joined me and is uh, now listening to our Comanche Zoom on appraisals with you. Um, in, uh, so this was a really interesting question. Stephen and Derek, I'm gonna flip your questions. In aviation, to what extent is valuation impacted by the duration or how long a plane goes listed without a sale? Good question. And it depends. Why? Why wasn't it sold? Um, if it wasn't sold because cosmetically it wasn't appealing, I don't know that the valuation would be impacted that badly. The question is, why isn't it selling? Was it priced too high in the first place? I saw an airplane the other day that I know good and well, the guy's wife said, you need to get rid of that airplane. He said, okay, I'm putting it up for sale today. And he did. But there is no way anybody's ever going to pay him that number for that airplane. And if they do, they're total idiots. And he knew that when he priced it. But I can put an ad out there and put a number on there. And if some fool shows up to take it, I can sell it and buy me two more. So why didn't it sell? Was it overpriced? Was it worn out? Was there problems with the airplane? To what extent? Nah, I can't say that there's actually an impact on the valuation because of the duration of how long it was out there without a sale. It raises eyebrows, but it also makes you ask the question. And without an answer to that question, I can't tell you what the impact might be. There may be an impact, there may not. If it's because it's just ugly with flowered upholstery that the wife chose, yeah, I can understand why it didn't sell. Good answer. Uh, There's a real joke about that where somebody put a picture of an airplane up that was priced at about twice market. And he was like, and the quote on that was, my wife is making me sell my airplane, but she didn't tell me how much I had to list it for. <laughs> uh, well, yep. There's the opposite to that too. I asked the guy, he left his wife and run off with his secretary. <laughs> And oh. said, I'm not coming back. So my Corvette made the money. She sold his Corvette for like $10 and sent it to him. <laughs> Payback hurts, doesn't it? Payback's a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> well, back hey, to Tracy, the buddy. just a quick question. Uh, just a little bit of a different flip. So um, I actually have two questions, but I'll just give it to one. But so what else do you think is driving the Comanche prices up, and I, I don't mean uh, putting in autopilots or new engines or paint or anything like that, but I guess more in, do you think the flying public, you know, or pilots are now, uh, say within the last five years or less, kind of figuring out, hey, a Comanche is a really hidden jewel of an airplane. I mean, it'll out, outdo a 182, or a, or a F-33 Bonanza, obviously it's not as fast, but if we're going distance, it'll out, outperform a Bonanza. Um, you know, so, I mean, I everybody I always talk to that I've seen, and I just talked to another young guy over here at Falcon Field the other day, had a 59 Comanche, and, and so um, I had to pull up and just introduce myself, and then we got talking about Comanches, and and, you know, kind of the same thing. Got, the gentleman just said, yeah, I, I bought this a few years ago. It was a 59,250. I think he said, because I asked him, I said, well, do you mind if I ask you what you paid for it? I think he said he paid 32, 30. I don't, I don't, I thought that's what I heard, but I, because I was kind of stunned at the number, but, um, but anyways, he said, yeah, man, this thing will outperform. And I, I just think a lot of people that I, all of a sudden, you know, every time I fly with somebody, or take them for a ride, they're all of a sudden like, wow, this thing gets up and goes. Uh, and it's really roomy. It's really comfortable. And how much gas are you carrying? So <laughs> I'm just wondering if you see any of that effect. Yeah. Alan, there's always, a, there's always some amount that might be that, but I don't think it's a real large amount. Right. The, the, the kicker and what pushes them up is supply and demand and people wanting them. Now, are those people yeah. wanting them the same people that have always wanted one or are they new people? And I don't have, there's no clue on that. It's just, right. you know, who's buying what, where, and, and I don't, I don't really have an answer for that. 
but yeah, okay. it's possible. I guess, I guess I will throw in my second question then, it's real fast, but so if you take an average price of a Comanche, which, you know, I think we could say, let's just say 60 grand, and then you put a brand new motor in it that's 35, and you got a panel, I mean, is it fair to say, you know, just because of the, you had a basic airplane that was worth 60, now you just put a brand spanking new engine in it at 35, we'll forget the panel and all that. I mean, is your, is, can you legitimately value that airplane at 95? No. Oh, okay. No. You can't because you ignored okay. what I said in the first place. You're saying no, there's an be. average airplane. <laughs> you're saying there's an average airplane going for sixty thousand dollars, and I'm saying there is no such thing as an average airplane in the first place. Okay, well, you I'm got to mind. strip out everything in order to get a base value on one of these things, and then add back in for the conditions and aircraft engines and interiors and paint and radios before you can evaluate a single airplane. So in your uh, imagination, if this $60,000 airplane needed a, a $35,000 engine, it probably wasn't worth 60,000 in the first place. Mm -hmm. If you look at the blue book, blue book says these all have a thousand hour engines in them. Now, how many airplanes have you seen out there with exactly a thousand hour engine in them? None. Mm -hmm. So there's no such thing really as an average. That's why we reduce them to a base value of taking all the components out it needs an overhaul, it needs new paint, it needs an interior, it needs all the avionics, it needs panel rework, it needs everything other than the fact it is currently airworthy. Okay. And once we get it down to that, then we can add back in for what this overhaul is going to cost. We can add back in for the time remaining on that engine. We can add back in for the interior value. We can add back in for the paint value. We can add back in for all these other add-ons that, that make up the components of this airplane and come to a, a valuation. We can't it. do it the way you're thinking of it. It just doesn't okay. work. I will say that uh, the interesting thing is two years ago, you could get a decent 250 for about uh, 40. 45. <laughs> and uh, I've been best I could find. And now another person that flew with me today is like i need one of those but you know the best command thank you there. so to some extent what we can do ourselves a favor as comanche owners and operators and do is as the word gets out and the general base level comes up then tracy gets to apply all of his contingencies to a higher general base level right. so that's what we can do we can get the word out we can continue to advocate for the key equipment that makes our aircraft more useful for the type of thing it does so well, like carry a lot, go a long way, and yeah. do it really efficiently. One, of, one, one thing I will say is one of the things as Comanche owners that we can do is maintain these aircraft properly. Quit bellying the blooming things in. The more we do that, the less the value of these things becomes because there is no replacement parts from Piper to put them back together. And as we lose aircraft, we don't have them to work with anymore. And that reduces inventory, which reduces the value overall to a point where it's going to hurt us eventually. So main, maintenance, 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 keep them right and stop cracking them up and we'll be a lot better off. I, I like this one question of how do you adjust value for a hangar queen? Very simply, you look at all the maintenance it's gonna to take to put it back in the air. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> you've got some pretty good invites here. So from Shane, uh, how much? Oh, yep. So there's a request about. Um, I like this one on so Loran. Can I answer this one on Loran? With ads with Loran yes. listed like it is a bonus, it's humorous <laughs> because it's actually a negative value item. We've got to right. subtract for it. It's got to be removed by somebody somewhere. <laughs> So let me let me take Shane's question and make it really gen general. Yeah, it's, it is pretty funny when you see the Lorans, or even better, like uh, an, an old ADF, although they're still useful in some places. Or an, I got an airplane over the new ADF. 
Oh, Even gosh. better. <laughs> um, but uh, Shane had a question that I think I'm going to boil down to. If the airplane was in your backyard or, you know, at your nearest yeah. airport, what would be an approximate cost to appraise a Comanche if we all started flocking down to you to get appraisals? Well, let's get a group buy going or something. I, no, I. Yeah, we could do that. I I charge between five ninety five and six ninety five, depending on what all you want done. First of all, one thing I do, and I always sell them when when I do it, I digitize every logbook I look at. I sit there and I actually just take the, the scanned camera and, and flip the pages through a logbook as fast as I can go and digitize the books. Now, if you want to keep those, I charge you an extra hundred bucks. And quite honestly, it's worth the effort because now you've got digitized logs in addition to your logs. You can't lose the things because they're already there. Uh, obviously, that doesn't help you going forward and keeping them up, but you do have a set of digitized logs that if you're going to sell it, you can advertise the plane with. Um, so that's, that's, you know, uh, that's the ballpark I charge, 595 to 695. Uh, for a single engine Comanche and uh, add, a, add a couple hundred bucks for the twin engine Comanches, even though they're pretty much the same airplane. They, uh, they're, there's a little bit of, you got to do another engine log book. You got to look at the maintenance on it, the maintenance on both engines. So they're a little more expensive, but that's where I charge. Now, what do other people charge? I have no clue. I really don't know. I, I, I know one guy here in town that will not touch an airplane for less than 1200 bucks. He wants to do the, he wants to do turbines and he charges 8,000 jet and gets it. Tracy, you said something about, uh, um, a, oh, this is George in uh, Western Massachusetts. We have a King Air up here, and uh, the word was from the company they're going to uh, fly it out to uh, Minneapolis and, uh, and have the entire uh, instrument panel changed to Garmin. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to cost three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, it's down from the four hundred and ninety-five or five hundred thousand that it originally cost. So, yeah. Yeah, and you can do it in uh, two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, that's quite a restoration. Um, I'm sure they're not doing it for aircraft value, but uh, they're doing it for utilization. usability. Yeah, it's a usable. It's a usability thing. Yeah, and, exactly. It'll and, last them. But um, uh, how is, did you say that was a um, it's not going to be, is it a wash for the, for the money? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, because what comes out of there, depending on what auto, I mean, depending on the things that are kept may depend on what the value of that comes out. Older avionics were expensive and still ex super expensive to maintain. Yeah. which is the reason they sell insurance and everything else on these airplanes uh, on the avionics packages, even to keep the avionics up late. Uh, the radar units, the radar units that are in there may or may not interface with the 1000. There's several variables that I can't even touch, but <laughs> if everything comes out and the G 1000 goes in and that's what goes in and you paid 300 and something thousand, it actually will reduce the value of the avionics in the airplanes. Oh, it will. Yeah, because, you know, there's uh, radar and there's uh, autopilot and all that stuff has to be hooked into the gun. Right. Well, and, and if that's the case and they're keeping the majority of the avionics, then that may not be the, that may not be the result of the effect. Yeah, I, I think they're going to waste everything that's on the dashboard, including instruments, um, uh, because the instruments go into the Garmin. Yeah. Uh, package and, and what so what what you're talking about here is because bendix king charges so much or collins charged so much for all of the avionics that were in there that their secondary market value is still very very high as spares for other aircraft that are still using them yeah and yeah, yeah it can end up as a negative early on it really was a negative at this point in time it may not be as much of a negative as it used to be because more people are going that route and the more of that that comes out of the market, the less demand for those older radios, the less of value they get. Yeah. 
So it's, it's so the rest of the nation life did. life expectancy is one of the critical factors of both our airplanes and our avionics. And we were getting if you still find a Comanche with a Mark 12A in it, run, okay? Because it hadn't flown in years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Oh, boy. And I took a radio out of a Comanche. Actually, it was a 180. Took it out of a 180 and put in a Mark 12A. <laughs> <laughs> now that's scary. That is cool. um, Marty Hench had a question, uh, and then I'm going to throw open, if it's okay with you, Tracy, just go, throw open the room for general Q&A, uh, uh, live voice. But Marty asked, is there any liability with an appraisal? Of course. There's liability with breathing. You might get COVID from what that air is you sucked in. So the answer is, yeah, there's always a liability. I, <laughs> in all the years I've, I've been in business, I've only had one instance where a guy questioned the, the appraisal that we had done. If it's done correctly and if it's done right, uh, it, it isn't a major liability, but it can be. I mean, people can sue you for anything these days, and uh, some of them do, you know. So what can I tell you? Yeah, Yes, there's liability. If you do a crappy job and are uh, negligent in your behavior uh, and negligent in your research and negligent in what you present, then yeah, you've got some liability. As long as you follow standard appraisal practice procedures, that liability is reduced greatly. If you don't follow those and you do this napkin appraisal for a bank, that bank should go back to that guy that wrote that appraisal and go, hey, we're $900,000 short, thanks to you, and we want you to make it up. And that has happened. It hasn't happened to a certified appraiser that, as far as I know, but it has happened. So can it? Yes. Yes, there is liability to it. That's why they need to be done right. Thanks, Tracy. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Marty. Uh, I'm going to just... Uh, First, uh, give the nod to Shane, but everybody just uh, feel free to unmute and then just please remember to remute afterwards so that uh, we've got 50 of us still on here. But Shane, did you want to um, clarify your, your question or comment? If, you, if the unmuting doesn't work for you, go ahead and just stick a note in the chat window and I'll do my best to translate your question or, or comment. Um, this is for Shane Henry. All right, then anybody else? I mean, I'm getting off that easy. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> this was fantastic, Tracy. I, had fun. I learned so much. Um, I'm giving away secrets. What can I tell you? No, it's not secrets. I want I want more knowledgeable buyers and more knowledgeable owners we have out there, the better off we are as, as Comanche lovers. And I'm more than happy to help. Yeah. You know, just knowing about the service and sort of starting to get a sense to what an appraisal is and the difference between VREF and Blue Book and an actual appraisal was hugely helpful because so many people call me up like cj how do i how do i price my airplane i'm like i i don't know i can kind of tell you what the ballpark is about how they're selling right now but beyond that i'm too ignorant to answer and that's kind of a market question we've got a much better sense uh okay shane actually did want to clarify his question so um he said after a gear down and complete engine breakdown uh i'm assuming you mean oh okay no mike yep um, I got it. I got it. I'm reading that. Okay. The answer is if you just do a teardown inspection and put it back in the airplane, you have, you have gained absolutely no value and you've lost value because it had a gear down. If, on the other hand, you overhaul that engine and put a new prop or an overhaul prop on it, you may actually end up gaining value on the airplane. So that was one of the things I was addressing earlier. If you got 500 hours left and you do a teardown inspection, you've lost your ever loving mind not to spend the extra money and get an overhaul because you're already paying for all of the expense of the teardown and removal and reinstallation. So wise money there would be, you know, depending on the time that's on it. 
I saw one the other day that had a gear up after 150 hours uh, since overhaul. And the guy sent it back in and said, overhaul it again. And I don't know that he was wrong. Uh, here's the problem about a teardown inspection. I had a friend that had a uh, Mooney 231. Moonies keep coming into this thing for some reason. They had a Mooney 231. <laughs> I won't even tell you the tail number, but uh, he repaired it. He was a repair guy and he, he it had a belly in and he repaired it and they wiped out everything. And this was before uh, Continental and like only published the information on what you need to do on a teardown. And he took off to take it to a paint shop and got over uh, Dallas Love Field, I believe it was, took off from south of there a little ways, got over Dallas Love Field and landed with oil all over the windshield. And he thought it was a front seal. So he put oil back in it and flew it back to where it was, where he could inspect it. And uh, still thought it was a seal, put a seal in it, ran it, ran it, ran it, took off to go up to... Uh, uh, to get it painted again. And he's taking it to Oklahoma, believe it or not. Took off, take it up to Oklahoma, got over Durant or one of those cities up there just over the Red River uh, when his windshield filled with oil again. He did an emergency landing and as he taxied off the runway, the prop fell off the airplane. That's called hmm. close call. But the reason was they never magnifluxed the crank and it had a big crack it's right broke. behind where you couldn't even see it. So all of his checking and miking and everything else didn't show that crack up because it was internal to the crank. So yeah, sometimes these belly ends and, and just getting a teardown inspection, you have to wonder about, and depending on who does it and how they did it, make sure it gets a real inspection and a close one. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, can you talk a little bit more about the different types of uh of teardown. So when we, if we have a, you know, if we do something that causes a pop or prop strike, um, and, and I'm asking you this because you, you had a conversation with me in preparing for this, that was really, really illuminating about like the five different kinds of, um, things you can do after a prop strike and the ones that will really make a difference to your value and potentially to your safety, as opposed to the ones that simply give you the logbook entry that may be lower cost. Yeah. Um, again, it, you know, a, a freshly overhauled, full overhauled engine is always going to be of more value than one that's had strange maintenance. One thing I will say, I saw one the other day that a guy had uh, 1,850 hours, I guess it was, on a, on a command sheet. And he just had a top overhaul done. And I said, that's got to be the dumbest thing I've seen in years. I'll be honest. I mean, seriously. Why at 1800 hours would you even think of doing a top overhaul on an engine that has a 2000 hour TBO? You're spending half of the money and you're getting zero of the value back. I don't care how many pistons you put on it. That's maintenance, folks. It is not going to return any value. It is keeping the engine running. The engine still has 1800 hours on it. Yeah, you got new cylinders. So what? They don't count. They have to be working in order to have it airworthy. So don't go crazy and spend real bucks when you're getting close to TBO to keep one running in this, because you say, well, geez, I know these engines are good for 3,000 hours. I'll just run it on up to that. If you're going to spend half of the cost of an overhaul putting new cylinders or doing something like that to it, don't just go ahead and, and bite the bullet and do the thing that makes sense of putting a fully overhauled engine back in that thing. And, and yeah, I don't know if that's what you were talking about, CJ, but I hope that helps for people to stop and think logically about return on investment. If I do maintenance, I'm not getting much of it back. If I do upgrades, I will get money back. And an overhaul mm -hmm. is an upgrade. That's a really, really clear, helpful way to think about our investment decisions in our airplanes. If I do upgrades, I might get money back. If I'm doing maintenance, I'm keeping it running. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's probably words to live by. The, the, the additional thing that you had said was the distinction in terms of what you could put in your logbook between a factory reman 
for a field overhaul and everything in between. And that was the thing I had in mind. There's a big range of of overhauls. Do you know I can actually take an engine to a mechanic and have him overhaul my engine? And as long as everything that he sees in there is within service limits, he can put it back together and say, this engine is overhauled. Now, I may only fly it 50 hours before I'm out of service limits, but he can call Mm -hmm. that an overhaul to service limits. And that's not an overhaul, folks. That is some sort of nutty deal that you can get away with and call it zero hours since major overhaul. Uh, And I always pay attention to that. I always look for that sort of thing to be going on because a lot of times you'll see a mechanic a field mechanic doing an overhaul and listing, here's your overhaul data, here's your logbook for the engine, and and here's what I did, and it just says overhaul. And I saw a logbook, I'm dead serious, says overhaul this day, such and such day, engine return to service. That's all it said in the logbook. And I said, well, what did he do on that overhaul? Well, he overhauled the engine. And you know, wait, 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 wait. An overhaul requires a little bit more of that. Does he have yellow tags? Does he have information on what he overhauled, what he put in there, what was done with the crank, what was done with the camp? And and the owner was looking at me like, what are you talking about? And I said, an overhaul means this engine was torn down, inspected, put back together. Now, what all was replaced within that engine when he did this quote overhaul? Well, I don't know. He just overhauled it. Okay. No, guess what? He really didn't. Same note. The yeah. logbook, the logbook rules, and that ain't going to be considered an overhaul by anybody that reads it. Now, is there a difference between that and a field overhaul done to factory new limits? Yes. And if I put in there field overhaul to factory new limits. Here's what all was replaced. Here's the yellow tags. Here's all the information on what went into it. Cylinders were sent out to Century or wherever I send them off to to get them done. And here's the overhaul on those. And they were all, engine was reassembled and put in the airplane. Yeah, that's an overhaul, but it's also a field overhaul because who, how good is the X number of guy that did it? And he said, well, I've done four of these in my lifetime, man. I know what I'm doing. I, I just did one six weeks ago. But that's different from a shop that does one a day or two a day or three a day and knows exactly what components and things they need to look at and get to. So a major shop overhaul versus a field overhaul versus a mechanic overhaul versus a factory remand versus a factory overhaul versus a factory new. That's the levels of overhauls that go on out there, and you need to be aware of them because each one of those carries a different valuation. You know, I think you've just given us a prescription for a Comanche Zoom. <laughs> it's got to be on all the time, honestly, honestly, because it's one of the, it's A, it's essential to safety, and B, it's essential to value, and C, uh, it's, you know, we need to understand that that these are all there and we need to understand what they mean so that we can make better decisions for our planes and our families. Well, Tracy, uh, I cannot thank you enough for bringing your wisdom and your experience and your love of Comanches uh, to our community. And um, I'll be, you know, we'll be talking because as we start to try to understand how to support our airplane and how to keep our values up, your experience and your business-like look at things is I'm kind of critical. hard nosed. I'm kind of hard nosed that way because I want to see people gain value in Comanches, and I want to see the Comanches live on forever. And I know they won't, but I want to see that. You know, I want to see somebody remanufacture the things, and I know that would be an impossibility. I was. Amen. Yeah, it'd be really neat. Anyway, I appreciate it you was, having me, and I thank you. I there, think what point, you did uh, was unique. Thank you. So- at this point, I'm going, Go to, ahead. I'm going to stop the recording, and uh, those of you who are still hanging in here, you can see it tomorrow, uh, probably mid-morning. I'll have it uh, ready to go up on the website, and those that missed it can find out for sure uh, You know all this wonderful stuff we just did. Thank you, Tracy, and I will be saying goodnight as I stop the recording.